One is going to be the chat. Weekend, guys. Yeah, quiet. Nice. Bring Yeah. Only those that are John, living with you. Time to be old, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Time to be old. Make bread, make foolish, <laughs> make sourdough. Oh, <laughs> making bread, cookies. Yeah, we got a couple of minutes here, Brad. We'll wait. There's some that arrive right on uh, T. Oh, okay, so you're going by that clock. Why? What is our? What do you have? I have eight oh three. Or behind. behind, yeah. yeah. I always go by that clock. Okay. We will start momentarily. Yeah, no problem, buddy. As far as I'm concerned, you're outside looking at this, but uh, for you, uh, for video making, so we don't mind signing away with just the case, we end up on crossing the video or whatever the case is, guys. I also have my. Uh, Camera going on here. <laughs> but as long as you guys are okay with that, we could tilt that one up just to tilt it up a bit. Yeah, just a bit. Did you loosen it a bit? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yep. Thank you, Chef. Okay, yeah, we might get some people. I've, I've posted it on Facebook for friends of mine and stuff who yeah, sometimes like to sit in on these things. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you need time to find out for you. So, uh, good morning, class. Good Monday morning. Uh, we're really lucky today to have uh, uh, Chef Mark Pook uh, here doing our, uh, our demo for the day on breads. Uh, Mark is coming to us with a wealth of experience, believe me. And I think maybe what we'll do, maybe someday Mark will get a bio with us. Uh, okay. To go with this course, so we're going to extend it, and I'm going to pass it right over to you. Mark was, uh, came to us uh, as a friend of the market, and he realized what the quality of, of your work was, and uh, it's, it's it's kind of become uh, the talk of the town at the moment, Mark. I don't know if you know that or not, but I'm sure you see that in the amount of product yeah. you're moving out of that market. So uh, it's very exciting to meet Fred, Fred to be here. And uh, I'm going to leave it to him. I'm going to leave it to him now. Right? Yeah, we've we've gotten comments at the market uh, from from people from France who say the last time they ever had a croissant like this was in Paris. Um, so that's that's really cool to hear. And um, I don't know if you guys talk much about some of the celebrity chefs in the world and the influences they have on us and and our you know our role in, in cuisine and hospitality. But one that a lot of people look up to, a good friend of mine is, is uh, considers him like a, his idol in that sense, is Thomas Keller. And Thomas Keller has a, an expression, I can't remember it word for word, but 
it goes something along the lines of that the whole reason we do this is to make people happy in the end right you know good food is all about making people happy it brings families together friends colleagues everything um and so you know that's what we're, we're trying to do we're, we're not trying to just make flour water and salt and and you know feed ourselves with carbohydrates we're trying to make each other happy right and like a really nice piece of bread and things like that so before i get into it all i'll try and be as brief as i can and give you a little bit about myself just so that as Donald said, they, so you understand my background a little bit. And uh, Chef, Chef, do they call you Chef Donald or Chef McKinnis? Chef Donald. Chef Donald. Okay. So Chef Donald and I met through a mutual friend by accident, um, and that is that friend assumed we knew each other already and had worked together. Um, and so that was uh, Noreen Chisholm. Um, her father is quite famous in Cape Breton as a, a famous fiddler and storyteller was Archie Neal Chisholm. And she was, uh, when I worked at the Celtic Lodge in 1983 and 84, um, she was the bartender there, right? And she was still there when Chef Donald worked there, but she thought we had worked together, but I was there for two years and two years later than he was there, right? But that's how we ended up meeting and thought, let's, let's try and make some pastries at the market and see what happens. So, and the rest is, history as they say right now. So I started off, um, I'm originally from Canada. I'm from Toronto, or I'm born in Toronto. Um, as I mentioned, the Celtic Lodge, that's why I'm here in Cape Breton because in 83, I fell in love with Cape Breton and always wanted to come back and retire here. Right? Um, I was the executive pastry chef there back then. Um, my father is German. So when there was a downturn in the economy and other circumstances in the early seventies, he moved the whole family to Germany. So I finished school in Germany and I did an apprenticeship as what they call a conditor, which is a pâtissier, chocolatier, glacier, and a little bit of baking. Um, in uh, bakery is a completely separate trade in Germany. So a lot of my bakery, my bread knowledge, I learned over the years after I came back to Canada. Uh, we did just basic breads in my apprenticeship. We just did uh, baguettes, buns, and some, some sourdough rye. That was it. Um, and so anyway, um, I worked through the industry a number of places. The apprenticeship is three and a half years working in a location, going to school one day a week. Um, and then I worked in a variety of different places, uh, wholesale bakery, convention centers. Um, and then I ended up at a global restaurant chain. They opened their first restaurant in North America in Toronto. I applied, got the job, moved back to Toronto. Uh, worked there it was uh, Moven Pick, uh, probably not a familiar name out in the Maritimes. Um, and uh, I worked at the Roy York Hotel, uh, the Celtic Lodge, as I had mentioned, and a number of other places, including the Windsor Arms Hotel in Toronto, where I was pastry chef for a couple of years. But that was kind of like the pinnacle of my dream job, right? Working in a four star hotel uh, with all antiques and things like that, catering to Donald Sutherland and Bernadette Peters and Peter Sutherland. and all these stars all the time who would come in. Um, had my brush with greatness with uh, Julia Roberts uh, back then, right, who held the door open for me as I left the hotel. <laughs> um, um, and, uh, but yeah, so I've, I've been in the industry for 45 years. I spent the last 25 years working for ADM, not a household name. Um, ADM is the, the full name of the company is Archer Daniels Midland. Um, ADM.com, you can look it up if you're interested. They're one of the largest uh, commodity processors in the world. Um, their sales are about 74 billion a year um, and they have about 35,000 employees. So I was one of those 35,000 cogs in the wheel. Um, I, I worked in the milling group, so a lot with, with uh, breads and flour and things like that for 14 years. Uh, then I got the chance to move to the U.S. and work in the central lab uh, in the, their research facility in Decatur, where I was for 11 years. Uh, and I worked on, I was a senior application scientist for bakery applications, which meant I worked with 350 different ingredients and using those in bakery applications, anything bakery, snacks or stuff like that. And some of it was troubleshooting, some of it was research, some of it was concept development and product development. So it all depended on customers' needs and things like that. And so a lot of outside interaction with customers as well and doing 
presentations and demos and things like that. And so that's an interesting slide note of a career you don't think about, you know, these development careers where they develop the products for sale and mass production or smaller production or pieces. And I'm going to expand on that some more later as we have time in, in certain, you know, well, you know, one of the things about bread and baking is it's a, it's patience. Um, there's, there's a lot of waiting time in between at times. Um, so it's, it's being patient with allowing the cultures and things to do their thing um, while you do whatever else you need to do relative to that, right? Um, if you're doing a lot all at once, of course, it can be extremely busy. Um, but if you're only doing two or three things, sometimes it just seems like you're doing more waiting than working, right? Um, and so, and, and I'll touch on some of those things because yeah, there's a lot of interesting career opportunities that, you know, if I didn't share those with you, it would be a big mistake, right? Yeah, um, so, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great industry. Um, we always say as friends and everything, you know, the, the hours are long, the pay sucks. Uh, you have to work holidays and weekends. Um, and it's the greatest job in the world, right? I mean, if you have a passion for it, uh, I'm retired. I, I took an early retirement package uh, from ADM last year, uh, actually the year before last, right? Uh, 2019, right? And um, I still haven't stopped really, right? I'm, I'm busier almost now uh, in my retirement than when I was working full time, right? Um, uh, I, as Donald mentioned, I help out at the market. Um, that for me starts on Monday because of prepping all the doughs and everything. Pastry and stuff takes time. Um, so, and I'm just rolling by hand at home. So it, it's not like I can produce everything on Friday and go to the market. <laughs> um, and uh, as you can see from this uh, chef coat, um, I'm also with uh, a company called Bakerpedia. It's a free resource for commercial bakers online. Uh, it's just www.bakerpedia.com. And they have live seminars uh, once a month. I do a podcast once a month. I do a, a video blog every Friday about our forums. We have a community forum, which I'm the community manager, and we're going to be doing more instruction videos online and things like that as well. And uh, so it's great fun helping these people. We're, we're spread all over the world from Singapore to Scotland. Um, but it's, it's a really fun group to work with. Right? And, a, and a great resource. Right? And a great, fantastic resource. Um, there's a, if you just go to like the under resources and ingredients, they, they keep adding papers um, and most, it'll tell you most of the time, it's like a six minute read or a 10 minute read or whatever. And it tells you about the key important things that you need to know about that ingredient, the functionality, its uses, you know, where it comes from or things like that. So if you want to know about mono, distilled monodiglycerides, you just go to resources, look under D, distilled monodiglycerides, and then click on it and you can read all about it, right? I just wondered about those on the weekend, Mark. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'm going to uh, start with the baguette because that's going to take kind of the longest for us so I'm gonna I'm gonna be flipping back and forth a little bit here, right? Um, because that's gonna take the longest for us to to be able to make from start to finish today, right? Um, and so I'm just gonna grab a large bowl. Sorry, chef, I didn't get set up. I need a, a large stainless steel bowl and some water. So baguette almost always for a traditional baguette starts with a poolish. Uh, this will make it easier. Yeah. Um, and so have you guys talked about pre-ferments a little bit already in, in general in class? Or is this your sort of your introduction to that? Okay, so we have basically five different pre-ferments. There's, there's poolish, bigger, sponge, Levin, and, and then just like a short, a quick starter, right? Um, but the four, the, the main ones that, that most people talk about, right? A Levin is generally a leftover piece of dough from the previous production. Uh, the, the bigger we're going to, I'll talk about more today, today as well. We have, we're using the bigger for the focaccia. Um, Poolish is a more wet starter. Um, and then, oh, there's also, of course, the sourdough starter that we're having. A sponge is something where a dough is made with yeast in it and it is fermented anywhere from four to 12 hours. Then 
a lot of that pre-ferment is about flavor development as well as uh, effects on gluten proteins, right? Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, so sponge and dough is, is a term you'll hear a lot in baking and sponge and dough is what's used primarily for commercial bread, like for, for white pan breads and things like that, right? So if you wanna have a, I'll pass this around here um, to have a quick look first before I use it. And this is a poolish, I started it last night at nine o'clock. So a poolish can be anywhere from eight to 18 hours, right? And a lot of that again is most of it after the first few hours is all about how much flavor, how much fermented flavor and lactic acid and things that you're developing. And you can see it's, it's bubbling and give it a little smell, right? You can, so you can smell the aroma. Perfect, thank you. Okay. So that Polish has fermented, produced that nice aroma for us. It also has an effect of, there's other enzyme activity that goes on that is naturally occurring in the flower and um, so the, uh, one of the ones are called protease enzymes and they have, they, they work on the gluten to make the gluten more extensible to, so that it's, it's less resilient. It doesn't buck back as much right? and helps it to, to stretch a little bit more. So we can take the poolish. What I like to do is add the water to the poolish and then stir that up a bit and just makes it easier, you can see, to get it all out of the bucket afterwards. Put that into the middle here. Now we're using instant yeast, we're not using active yeast. Do um, you know the differences? Any? Okay, so which do you have to activate? It's actually, it's misleading because we call it active yeast and that's the one you have to activate. And in the sense that what you're, it, what, what you're really doing is, is you're releasing the, the active yeast because if you see them side by side, active yeast is like a large dark grayish brown pearl. And so the yeast is coated with starch. So the reason you're putting it in warm water or warm milk and wait for it to bubble is to dissolve that starch layer that's protecting it outside. Whereas instant yeast, which is what we're using here today, you can see is, is very fine. It's very fine little, little and they, it basically dissolves instantly, right? So it is either can be mixed either with the water or with the flour. Most commonly it's mixed with the flour. The important thing is with instant yeast is it doesn't like to be shocked by cold water. If for some reason you're making a cold dough for retarding or something and using very cold water, that'll damage the yeast. So you want to blend it with the flour if you're using cold water, right? So I'm just gonna sprinkle that over top. And I'm mixing this together, just gently mixing it all to what we call a shaggy dough. 
so that it's just, it's gotten everything wet, it's moistened, it's hydrated. I've not added the salt yet because the salt affects um, the, it, it uh, slows down the, re, the fermentation and it also tightens up the gluten a lot, right? And it's going to fight for water. It has, we talk in science, they say osmotic pressure because the salt is gonna rob the water away from the gluten. So now we're doing what um, the French call an autolase, right? Or a, a pre-soak, right? So what happens when we're making bread doughs is we think of flour as this powder that is absorbing all the water. When in actual fact, if you, if you think about the, the protein quantity and quality is the gluten network that we talk about, right? There's this glut glutenin and gliadine, and when they are hydrated and kneaded together, they form gluten. That's the only thing that's soaking up water. The, the rest is just starch granules and water is coating the surface of the starch granules, but it's not being absorbed. So the, the gluten is the only thing that really is absorbing water in the dough making process. And that is allowing all that elasticity and extensibility of the gas. And then when you bake it, the starches unlock and set everything in place and let some of the water evaporate. You usually use, lose about uh, anywhere from eight to 12% water of your, in, your, in your baking as a, as a baking glass. So we're just going to let this uh, rest to autolase. And that is to allow the gluten to continue to absorb water. That is the whole, there's no need process of gluten development, okay? So I'm gonna just set that aside for a moment and uh, have my salt at the ready so I don't forget it later. Oh, I can take this thing off. <laughs> and, uh, and so we'll, we'll move on and talk about the sour now while that is resting. And we want to give this, uh, I think in the notes, it says 45 minutes to an hour. Um, Autolase is pretty flexible. Um, you know, you can, half an hour is what I would like to say ideally. Even 20 minutes will do. Um, it depends a lot on thinking about what is the rest of your process, because we're going to do a lot of stretching and folding. Um, if, if we let this rest for about half an hour, that should be plenty, right? When I mix my... Um, I love technology. I love playing around with 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 uh, thing, technical things and stuff. And so uh, we have uh, I have Alexa at home, right? And uh, with Alexa, you can build routines. And so I've I've created I built this little routine for whenever I mix my croissant dough. Is because I like to mix the dough with the water for three minutes, let it rest and auto lays for twenty minutes, and then continue mixing for six minutes. So I have the the mixer on a on a, a smart plug and basically set up a routine. I just say to Alexa, uh, Alexa, I'm making bread. And then it turns the mixer on, mixes, shuts it off, waits, turns it back on again. So, you know, I can do other stuff while that's all happening. Right? So um, I brought along, I, uh, for the sour, I, I brought along some that I made already. And I brought along sour that I've prepared and I've brought along sour doughs that have been retarded in the, in the fridge overnight already so that we can actually see some bake because the sourdough process is the longest. It's a six day process start to finish basically. Um, and, and so uh, Chef Donald told me that you've, you've been asked to uh, create your sours and name them, right? Um, and so these guys here, these guys were produced from Alphonse. Right? Um, and all of the sours I've made are, are the same. Uh, this one is, of course, is just a, a day or two older. You can see some of the stuff I'm get, getting off the edge here is because it kind of blew up this morning and almost uh, over fermented, right? But you'll see right now it's only about half full. And it's, it's kind of liquidy. And you, if you think about what you smelled with the poolish, and you can smell how much more sour this is now, right? Um, and so this is Alphonse, which I started on. I started last week anyway. I um, can't even remember what day it was. I think it was either Friday or Saturday. Right? Um, and, and so that is following the same refresh procedure as, as in your notes. Right? 
and and so with that I made these uh, sourdough loaves, and I used the ratio in the notes that is uh, 600 grams of bread flour, 300 whole wheat, and 200 uh, rye. I think it was right. Let me double check. Or was it 100 rye? 300 whole wheat and 100 rye. Thank you. <clears throat> and if you Notice this one has a little bit brown specks in it. Uh, it's because I like to start my, um, my sour the very first day, I, I like to use whole wheat flour. Um, I've got no clear scientific proof, but I believe I'm getting a little more wild bacteria from that in, in the brand and stuff like that, right? Um, and so this one is Bob. As you, you'll see a theme from Alphonse to Bob. And this is a day later. So you'll see this, this might smell a little less pungent, um, but very, very close. And this is the one we're using today. And this is Caroline. Thank you. So I could just name them one, two, and three, but it's just, it's more fun to give them a real name, right? Um, uh, and uh, if you've, if any of you are, if you're readers and uh, you you might enjoy um, Anthony Bourdain's uh, Kitchen Confidential uh, stories from the the underbelly of the kitchens and things like that. And there's a, a passage in there where he talks about his relationship with his, his pastry chef and his baker. And they were, they were making sourdough fresh and having to follow the whole feeding schedule all the time of feeding the, the, the sour and stuff like that. Um, so in, in this format, what we're doing is we're doing approximately a 24 hour feed. So you're feeding it once every day. Um, and uh, then on the fourth day, you're taking off 20% um, and discarding that or making some pancakes or something with it. And um, then you're, you're replacing that. It doesn't mention that in the notes here, but I've, I've said to, to Chef Donald that I think it might be a typo because why else take 20% off? You usually want to replace it again, right? Every time you remove from the sour, you're feeding it, right? And um, you need fresh water and fresh carbohydrates for the, the yeast to ferment. And so what is, is doing, what's happening is you're getting yeast cells that will double about every four hours. Um, they will separate and create. So from one come, becomes two yeast cells. As they split, they produce CO2, they produce alcohol, and they produce lactic acid, right? Um, and um, so the lactic acid is the sour note that you kind of taste or, or, or smell and things like that. Um, depending on the temperature ranges and how often you feed is the variability of how much lactic and acetic acid you get. So acetic, you may be familiar with is vinegar, right? That's because of the, the alcohol production that's taking place that then flips over to an acetic acid afterwards. Right? And so if you feed more often and at lower temperatures, like say refrigerated, you will get more lactic. So you'll get a more mellow sour, less, less vinegary, less pungent, right? You feed less frequent and keep it warm, you'll get more acetic acid. You'll get a more vinegary, strong, sour flavor. Um, and so sours were born out of, you know, 6,000 years ago in starting baking and, and discovering this way of leavening, right? Um, became very popular here in North America uh, during the Wild West, as they call it, as they would have these chuck wagons. And that was a way of keeping a fermentation alive as they would keep the sour going and make bread from it every day, right? That's where like the, the famous San Francisco sourdough comes from and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so what, what, I, what I've done here with these ones, so you have as a comparison reference is I used, as I mentioned, the, the 100 grams of rye, 300 whole wheat and uh, uh, 400 uh, bread flour. 
And I also, I kind of undermixed it a bit in that I didn't, didn't mix it in really well and I didn't fold and stretch a whole lot. And so you can see they kind of spread out a bit. Um, and even though they were proofed up in the banneton, um, this is what we call a banneton. It's basically a, a wicker bowl, or you could simulate that by taking a stainless steel bowl and lining it with a, with a cotton towel. Right? Um, I proof them in the banneton without the liner. I, I line it with flour, and then that's how it gets also these little lines on it and things like that. Right? Um, <clears throat> and we do have the banneton's in the in the office, by the way, actually. No worries. I find the advantage with the the line. I find the right stick. Maybe I'm just not powerful, but I find that this piece of wicker that it comes out a lot easier. Oh, it comes out easier with the wicker. Yeah. Yes. Um, if you even when you use it with the towel, you want to spray it. Okay. Um, you want to mist it. I brought. I thought I had brought my mist. Um, oh yeah, here it is. So I I use a little mister. Um, you want to mist it. I find rye flour works a little better because it's finer. Um, but but you by misting it first, you help the flour stick to it as you're coating it. Um, and then that kind of basically creates a layer between the, the dough and the, the basket or the towel, right? Um, so yeah, and a lot of times people use the towels so that they find it easier to peel the towel off, right? Um, because if you don't spray the basket well and coat it really well, it will stick to the basket. And then it, by the time you release it, it deflates. Um, so, but yeah, very good point. That's, it's good that you mentioned that. So with the sourdough, um, we have again, a salt and yeast separate. Um, so I've done this one with the three flowers. Uh, the ones I've prepared here, that we're gonna put in the oven in a little bit is Garfield is keeping them warm. So these were made yesterday. So you see, I just put them in the refrigerator with the cover on it and just a layer of uh, plastic over top. And I did one just for interest in a different shape, in the oval shape, but that they're all from the same doll. So I'm just gonna put them here so you can see them first. Thank you. Yep. And so this one I've done only the 300 grams whole wheat. And this one I've gone even lower with the whole wheat. And the reason I, I've done that is that since we're doing the, the three batches to create some TV magic, it's just so that you can also see the effects of having stronger and weaker flours in the dough formation. Right? Um, because rye flour has almost no gluten in it at all. Right? Um, whole wheat flour is a little bit weaker in gluten. The, the flour part is is strong gluten, but the bran has no gluten in it. It's just, it, it interferes, it just absorbs water. It actually interferes with the gluten network. And like, like it's, as gluten is trying to form, the bran is getting in the way and breaking it up, right? So the less you have of these interfering grains and things, the more you, your development you get, the more the stronger it'll hold its shape and things like that too. Um, so here is the, the one with the, as I said, in the uh, oval banneton. So I, I sprinkle a lot of flour and stuff on top. When I cover with plastic, I also spray the plastic with pan um, or, or any kind of pan release, right? um, just to make sure that it, it doesn't stick. Right? And so I'm gonna be turning those out onto um, trays to bake. Yeah, they're on already. Yeah. 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 And when baking, the one thing you always want to remember if you're going to bake, you need to preheat your oven. You, you can't put it into a cold oven. Um, especially with bread, you need the high heat for the jump. Um, and fans, check your fans and your temperature. We've, we've, we've had trouble here with putting things in the oven and high fan. Pretty shouldn't happen. 
As you see, I've been handling it slightly cautious in that I don't want to bump it too much because that could break the bubbles and then they would deflate. All right, so um, our uh, baguette has probably rested long enough that I can add the salt and start my folding. And then I'll just transfer it to a smaller bowl to use this bowl for preparing the sourdough. Can you see that in the mirror? Okay. Yeah. So you see, I'm kind of folding it over top of itself to get the, the salt worked in. Thank you, Chef. And in today's world, a lot of times the reason we use bowls is primarily for sanitation and easy cleanup. You could do this on the counter as well. You could mix it up on the counter, cover it with a towel or plastic or something um, for its resting period. So now you can see it's starting to come together. It's really pretty much almost like in a, if I was kneading it, it's, it's starting to clear the bowl, right? So that is the, the gluten is starting to develop. So now I'm gonna put this into a smaller bowl and just reuse this uh, same large bowl. Oh, and speaking of um, pan release, do you have any pan release handy yes. by any chance or oil? Um, oil is fine too. I just, I like the convenience of the pan release because it's so, you get such a nice thin coating. Thank you. A gift from the kitchen god, we call that. <laughs> I'm just going to put this up here. So that can go now to, again, to uh, rest until we're ready to uh, stretch and fold. Um, so now we're gonna do the same thing kind of with the, for preparing the sourdough. So I have the, the flour and as I, I mixed in already the whole wheat flour here. Now I don't have any of the extra K that is mentioned in the recipe. I don't know if you guys do. Um, that is a bread improver from a company called Irex uh, out of Germany. Um, it, it is common in the baking industry. That, that recipe is from Dominic Ansel out of New York, who uh, is a French pastry chef and you know buying things commercially and stuff like that. If you don't have the extra K, that's fine. Um, what I did, because I'm buying the flour retail, I'm not buying, I've not yet uh, secured a source of commercial flour. Um, the protein levels aren't always as high. There's not as much gluten in my bread flour that I buy at the store, the, you know, the Robin Hood homestyle white or whatever. So that 30 grams of extra K, instead I put 30 grams of wheat gluten in, um, vital wheat gluten. So I give, I'll get a little bit more strength that way. Um, and I'm going to add the, the instant yeast in now so that I can blend it with the flour. Now, the instant yeast, as it mentions in the recipe, is not always necessary. It's kind of like a safeguard because in theory, all your yeast is already here. This is where your, your yeast is, is in your, your sponge, your sour that you created. And so the amount of water here is 800. Okay.
Thank you. Okay, now it mentions to put most of the water in. Um, thank you, Chef. One of the things that if you're as a beginner, it also comments, I think that you can use 75 instead of 80% water. Um, so, and, and using those terms is, um, are what we call Baker's percent. Have you guys talked about Baker's percent in 100 and stuff? Okay, so it's just ratios. It's just a simple ratio. Um, so for every kilo of flour, we're using 800 grams of water. That's 80% hydration. That's very high for bread. That's a very soft kind of bread. If you're thinking of say sandwich breads and things like that, they're usually in the 55 to 65% range, right? Depending on flour quality and stuff like that. Whole wheat will always use a little more water uh, because the bran particles absorb a lot more um, and other flours, you know, like all purpose and stuff will use less because it has less protein. Um, and so in terms of adding most of the water, you really want to try and add, you know, as much as you can, um, because if you leave too much water behind, it gets really hard to work it in and you'll get lumps. Right? So th the reason for leaving some of the water behind is for scaling your sour and making it easy to get out of the bowl. So all I really want is just a teeny bit of the water so that it's coating the bottom of my container that I, I measured the water in. Um, and here again, we're going to mix this to a shaggy dough. That is to just, I'm just keeping my fingers apart, kind of like a, a spider or whatever. Um, and just stirring that around. Try and get as much of it hydrated as possible. And we're going to let that stand to auto lace. Now I added the yeast in right away, um, which is just helping to allow the yeast to dissolve. In, in some of the formulas, it'll tell you to run the auto lace, just the water and the flour first and add the yeast afterwards, right? Um, both will work uh, equally well. There's, there's no harm one way or the other. I like to ensure that my yeast is gonna get nicely hydrated and you know soaking up water together with the flour, right? Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in the cabinet. Take the sheet shut. Yes, I'm so used to doing so much at home, I forget we have a cooking cabinet here. <clears throat> Just a magnet or is there a lock? Yep. Thank you very much, Chef. Yep. Yeah, it's just a sticky magnet. And so now I have my the remaining water here. And again, I leave the salt last because that's really that's more important than um, than with the yeast. If I add the salt in too early, it not only affects the yeast but it competes with the gluten on on hydrating and stuff. And where's my, oh, there it is. And so now I need 150 grams of Caroline. And so this way I can add it to the water here.
and just stir that up a little bit. And I'm just gonna pour it over top to help keep it moist so it doesn't dry out, don't have to put plastic on and things like that. And then just after it's had a chance to hydrate, then we can mix it together. Yeah, and I think some of it is, is some of these things you learn over time, especially when you have to work by yourself or in circumstances where you don't have all the plastics or you don't want to deal with all the messy plastics or um, just you're in a hurry, right? It's, it's faster than searching for a plastic bag and, and covering it up and things like that. So we're just going to let that uh, sit for a while. And... So now if I want to keep using Caroline, so you remember you, you started everything on, on Sunday, but now let's say you, you, you like this so much and process and sourdough bread, you wanna make bread every day, right? <laughs> so this is the starter that you guys have started at home, right? So then, cause we took 150 grams of starter out, we would put 75 water and 75 flour back in. And then tomorrow we can make bread from it again. If we don't make bread, you have then a choice. Either you take some of it out and refresh it and just throw it away, or you double it up so that you have more sour, right? And then of course you'll have a big batch of sour eventually after a while to make lots of breads. Right? Unless you truly really have a plan to make a big batch of bread later on, I don't recommend doubling it up. It goes out of control really fast, right? You because your one day. Uh, well, yeah, I, 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 had, I had at one point, I had like three containers of like this full of sour in the fridge and my wife made me get a new fridge. <laughs> um, so I have a separate fridge for baking because it stinks right? um, as far as she's concerned, right? Um, and so, but yeah, it, it, it very quickly, you can end up with too much. So you don't want to necessarily keep doubling it too much, right? But it's, it's a great way to make flavorful bread, even if you're not using this as your ferment foundation. If you're um, like one of the, you know, with, with things we, we want to try and eat healthy more today and, and things and, and things you want healthy to also taste good, right? So, um, you know, with, like Donald said, you know, it's a good time to be old. But <laughs> um, some things with aging, you know, it's like we, we want to really make sure that we're eating a lot of fiber. I have I have cholesterol issues, it's hereditary. So I have to really eat a lot, of, a lot of fiber all the time. And so eating plain white bread as much as I love it is not necessarily the best thing for me. Um, and so I'll make breads where I'm using a lot of whole wheat flour and I add uh, like large flake rolled oats to it. And then I like putting things in like sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds, or maybe even walnuts and, and stuff like that. And then I'll add some sour. Um, and the sour is, is just to give it that nice fermented flavor and a little bit of sour. Um, and that helps us give the, the bread nice character and things like that, right? Um, you know, I mean, molasses is great too, but you don't always necessarily want everything to be sweet, right? And you don't necessarily want to have high sugar intake all the time either, right? Because it's already a lot of carbohydrates that you're, you're eating with that. Um, okay, um, so... Uh, why don't I, before I start the focaccia and talk about the bigger, let's put these in the oven. So we'll get a couple of pans. Uh, do you use uh, silpats or liners or something yes, like that? Yeah, just about the silpats. That'll be fine, yeah. Um, and that, it'll work quite well with, with in the pan and the silpats. At home, what I like to try and do is I bought some pizza stones. And so I'll heat up the oven with the stones in it. And um, to create steam because I don't have a rationale oven at home. Um, not sure about you, but I didn't have forty thousand dollars laying around to buy a rationale oven. <laughs> um, and um, so I put a cast iron pan in the bottom and let that get hot with everything too. And then I just take a couple of large, like two, three large ice cubes with some water, and I throw that in the cast iron pan, and then put the bread in. And I use actually like this oven peel to 
slide the bread in onto the stone and then it, it bakes, it just gets a nicer bottom crust that way, right? But even so, um, what you wanna have on the bottom, whether you're baking directly on the pan with, with a, a spray, or if you're using uh, like the sill putt, there, there are also um, specialty sill putts for, for bread baking that have, they're, they're black with like a mesh. And so they're, they're supposed to give better bottom heat um, for, for bread crusts, right? So they, so if, if you do think you're going to do a lot of bread baking in your restaurant and stuff, and you want to have dedicated sheets for that, you can get those, right? You do have them um, for, other, for other applications. Yeah, they, they have them. Like I have them at home for uh, hamburger buns. It, it's like a nice shape for that. Or like I have it for little demi baguettes on the half pan, right? Um, and they work really well. But either, but for, so for this type of thing, if you're spraying it or using parchment paper or using the silicone mat, you want to put some granular material down to help give you that crust and so that the dough can lift off of it easily as it bakes. Um, most of the recipes like in here, they often refer to cornmeal because that's what's most commonly available, especially in the US, all right? Um, in the US, they don't use farina as much as we do here in Canada. In Canada, most bakers will use what, the, or in the Americans call it farina. Um, and that name is gravitated into the Canadian lingo more and more. In Canada, we usually call it wheatlets. Um, and, um, and it is basically in the milling process, it's really the, the wheat kernel when it's broken before it becomes flour, right? So it's almost like semolina, but of course semolina made from durum is very expensive. That's why it's used mostly just for pasta but it's that type of material. Um, a cheap way of getting semolina, especially if it's just at home, is you buy cream of wheat because that's what it is. It, I mean, uh, wheatlets, right? So I, that's what I just use is simply cream of wheat. The disadvantage is the cream of wheat has the bran in it, okay? Whereas if you buy uh, wheatlets from, you know, in commercial quantities, they will be completely golden. There'll be no bran, they're completely clean, right? Um, and so you want to dredge it with your cornmeal or wheatlets. No, so what's the difference? Why bother with wheatlets versus, versus corn? The wheatlets are smaller. They're, so they're, I find they're not as hard. They're not as quite as crunchy as the wheat. And of course, visibly, you can see it's, it's there, but it's not big, bright yellow like you would get with corn, right? Um, and so then we have, so this, to, to your point, this banneton, I, I did it this way with, with the flour, right? So we'll see, we're gonna find out now how bad it's gonna stick, right? Um, and so, see, it came out quite nicely. So you see how it's, it's still spreading a bit, right? Because we have a very high hydration dough here is what we're doing. Right? And so these are then the round ones. I think we're just gonna fit on the tray. Time to buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> So now the, um, the other thing we, we want to do before we put these in the oven is we usually want to score it. Scoring is done for a variety, a variety of reasons. Um, a lot of today, there's, there's bakers, if you're not making the dough uh, quite as, as high a hydration as this, it holds its shape a lot better. And then you could do all kinds of fancy scoring, right? Scoring, and I think in the books we refer to it as spotting. The yeah, you're, you're slashing the dough or, or scoring it. And so um, scoring can be, for example, you, you might do a cut down and then some little cuts in and, you know, and other cuts on the side like an S and then that way it opens up in that pattern, right? And by having it heavily dusted with rye flour or wheatlets helps enforce that pattern. With these high hydration doughs, 
it's very difficult to score them um, and so, or to slash them. So we don't try to do anything too fancy, but it is important still to score them or slash them to allow the bread to develop and open up. Okay, so that doesn't just crack wildly where there is where maybe a weak spot. Um, and it helps sometimes in many uh, cases, it develops that as far as the internal crumb, that the, the texture and it changes the flavor, right? Um, in France, they're so strict about it that baguettes have to have either five or seven slashes. You can't have more or less because it changes the flavor characteristics and things like that. Right? So there's different ways. This is, this is called a lame, um, or it's spelled lame, L-A-M-E. Um, and really it just means blade, right? Um, so, and what it is, is if uh, you guys are all probably maybe too young, but I'm sure Donald or maybe remembers the old razors that you screw it open and it, it flips open like a cool uh, spaceship thing and, and you put the blade in and close it down and that's what you would shave with. So that is the same type of blade. It just goes on here on this holder, right? And so it's a razor blade. And you can use it to cut into the dough to help give it some release to rise. And you don't want to be too forceful because it will collapse easily otherwise, right? So this is one that I bought that you, you can replace the blades and you, know, you could use them a few times and then they get dull, right? Um, you can also get these are disposable. I, I got this one for free with something that I bought. Um, and they usually sell them like in packs of 10 or 20 and they're used a lot in bakeries as you know, it has a nice little grip here, especially for baguettes and things, you'll, you'll see it's really easy to hold. The idea is also, you don't wanna cut straight down. You wanna cut in on an angle, okay? You wanna cut into the dough. And you can see with these very wet doughs, it's very difficult to cut them, even with a sharp razor blade. And lastly, um, this is what, in, like in Germany, when we did uh, things for baguettes or breads and stuff, this is a type of small serrated knife that we would use, and it works very well as well because it's kind of self-sharpening. They last a long time, and it does a pretty good job of cutting in as well. And so these loaves are a uh, little over 600 grams each. So it's a slightly bigger than a standard loaf of bread, which is usually around 500 grams. Um, but you know, a loaf of bread that you bake in a pan has the re resistance of the metal pan yet too. So it's always rule of thumb is 30 to 35 minutes, okay? We're gonna put these in a preheated hot oven and we wanna give it a shot of steam in the beginning. So we preheated, the, the rondo here to 450, right? Um, because that's a little bit hotter than a standard oven. If it was a range oven, uh, you would preheat to 500, okay? And, and then have some steam in there. Or I also use in combination with the ice cubes, I, I squirt it in with the, with the bottle at home and I squirt it onto the metal of the, the, the walls of the oven to create steam, right? And so we'll set a timer for 35 minutes on these. And um, I did bring my thermometer with me too. And we always want to, I'll show you then how we check for doneness. Um, sorry, I forgot to put my mask on. Advanced trends down here too. Mm -hmm. That should be good. Okay, thank. Sorry, I forgot to put my mask on here. 
Um, so I put them in, I give them a shot of steam and I've turned the temperature back down to 420 because I want it really hot when it goes in, but I want the baking temperature to be 400 to 420 and for a convection oven. Right? And um, I set the timer for 35 minutes. And so the steam is important to pre-gelatinize or, or just gelatinize the starches on the surface of the bread. So, and that means it's, it's cooking them by steam. And this way allows those starches to still stretch. And that's what helps give it that nice crisp crust because those starches are already cooked by the time they finish stretching and start to set. And when it dries it out so that it, it dries out better and becomes nice and crisp that way. So for crusty breads, you always want to use steam. Anytime it's what we call a lean bread, okay? Lean breads are anything that has little or no fat, little or no sugar, um, and usually also no eggs, right? So something like a brioche is, for example, a extremely rich bread. So the opposite of lean, we refer to as rich. And so lean breads with steam, rich breads without steam, because with rich breads, we're not trying to make a crust, right? It's starting to puff up a little bit. Oh, the, 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 the pan is tilting. Yeah, that's, that's just the, uh, the metal um, because of the hot and the oven and uh, some of the, um, sorry, I keep forgetting about the mask. I obviously haven't taught a class like this. <laughs> um, some of the, the, the rims inside the metals are, they're, they're not holding it straight enough. So then they, they, they warp a little bit. Um, as long as it isn't anything fluid for something like bread, it, it won't hurt it. Okay, good so far? Everybody still awake and with me? Yeah. I might give them a leg stretcher of 10 minutes or so at some point if, you're, if you want, but that's up to you. Yeah. Um, I usually go around 10. I forget, I'm too fresh out of the industry. I forget about it. But I do too. I, I usually just keep going. But, yeah. Now we've only been at it for an hour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get some of these going next. So you saw the um, uh, the foolish, the sour, and now we're going to talk about the bigger. Um, so a bigger is what's used typically for most Italian style breads, right? And I did this one in the pan. You can see a little bit of the, the pan has surfaced on this. Um, again, you want to smell the aroma. You'll see it smells very different. It does not have that sour flavor that you get with the, uh, the foolish or the sour. But it has a very distinct fermented aroma. So if you think of ales or... Um, you know, all of any of these types of short fermented beers, it, it's sort of that type of uh, aroma in that sense, right? That not hoppy, but um, yeah, very, uh, very fermenty. Yeah. And so this, this bigger is actually in, in this recipe is what I would say it's a pretty soft bigger by, by things that I've different done. Um, and there again, the, the wetter you make it, you'll get a little more slight sour notes showing up. The drier you make it, the more of just the fermented notes you get. Um, the absorption on this one, I think it was like 60% or something. Uh, so it's three, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, 270 and 330, so it's really high. Yeah, so that's, um, so what's 330 divided by 270? 
say at 60%. Um, so that's fairly high for a bigger. A lot of the, the biggers tend to usually be uh, really low, like some even as low as 45, but 50 is more typical. Um, so that it's, it's a stiff toe. Um, I can tell you that when you're making small amounts of figa at home or in a, you know, a smaller restaurant, that the easiest way to stir the bigger together is to use the handle of a spoon um, is the, when they're really dry because it, it's otherwise really hard to mix, right? Um, and so this one was slightly softer one and um, I put it in the tray so that I could it spread out and, and stuff so we could see all, all the nice bubbles afterwards, right? And so this is, um, again, the same type of uh, procedure in general. Um, we're going to have, uh, now they call for um, milk here um, to, to get some uh, milk flavor, some richness into it. It's not absolutely necessary. Um, you could add, add milk powder if you wanted to as well. Um, I like to keep it, the, the uh, focaccias and chapadas really lean. So I'm just gonna go with, with water for everything. Um, but I will keep in mind that the milk is about 10% solids. So instead of using 75, I will only use 70 water, right? Um, so about half the percentage of Dover or is that your math? No, seven and a half percent. So if I did 10% did less would be 67 uh, would, would be yeah, 67.5. Oh, yeah, right. So I just rounded it up to 70, yeah, okay. right? Um, and, uh, and 295 water. Uh, so that, that brings me to 365. And the big I don't have to weigh this time because I know it's 500 grams because that's exactly what we made. Three hundred and sixty-five, and we have here the yeast and the salt and the flour. So in this recipe, they're saying to mix the flour and salt. Again, I don't advise that. I always advise keeping the salt added after you have everything hydrated. And so I'm gonna make a well in the center, get my gloves ready. Let me put the bigger in first, it's easier. And so you'll see compared to the, the poolish and the other, you see how this is pretty much dough-like, right? It has a lot of texture to it. Very much. And by having oiled the pan, you see it came, or I, I sprayed it with, with the pan release, pretty much most of it all came out pretty easy. Water. And the yeast. Now, can you make, make these doughs in a mixer with a dough hook and kneading it? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, the difference is that you will not get as irregular a cell structure inside, meaning when you cut it open in the grain, you'll 
see it's somewhat irregular. The, it's not nice, even little bubbles. There's big ones and small, small ones. And that irregularity is sort of an artisan characteristic that we're looking for in these types of breads. And so that's why we don't uh, need them in a mixer for that reason. And, and this is also being able to have a way of so that you don't have to have a mixer necessarily tied up with making bread all the time. So I'm just combining this all together. And again, we're going to let this do an auto lays and then let this sit for 20 minutes or so before we add the salt in and start our bulk ferment and, and folding process. Now this dough is not super wet. So if you, you know, especially if you're not using gloves and if you got all the dough stuck on your hands, it takes a little practice to get used to how to handle it so it doesn't stick too much. Um, I've, I've seen all kinds of fun pictures of people trying to handle their dough and it, it's, um, it's hard to explain. You, you get a feel for it and how to handle it, how to, how to pull your fingers away so it doesn't stick as much. But when you do have a lot is you just dip your hands in flour and rub them and then it all comes off, right? Um, when you'll see when we start working with the, the sourdough, uh, pr primarily with wet doughs, what you do is you dip your hands in water, okay, to prevent it from sticking because the dough is so wet if you, and you don't want to keep adding flour to the dough because the whole point is we want to have that high hydration dough that gives us uh, that different appearance and stuff. So this would be a good time to take a short break for a leg stretch in that. And because we're gonna let this rest and then. Um, sure. Yeah. And so then we'll, we'll get back to stretching and folding and the breads may be done and things will keep moving forward slowly. Hey, you guys, it's uh, 10 after, so uh, 25 after, right? Huh? Good, guys. Thank you. Thank
Thank you. That's great, thanks. Well, Friday, we get to do some bacon and breads. Fun stuff. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it doesn't get bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not bad. There's three. There's only one. Oh, yeah. Are you living in Sydney? Yep. But uh, do you, are you just have a flat up here? You, you live down north? Uh, back and forth. It's both kind of summer summer. And the winter's nice. If you want to do it, keep going. You know what? I used to be impressed with how many, how many season holder, season ticket holders 
for the Oilers that were north of smoke. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but usually, the, well, up there it's a lot colder than we are here, right? They're in the highlands, yeah, right? Um, and and the thing is, there. It's gonna be like also like in the summertime. It's gonna be like a, a giant zip line or something like that they're putting in there too. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's. They really need that summer market. I think that's what yeah. Well, the, the Celtic used to run the ski lodge a long time ago. Yeah. In our time, they did. Yep. And in fact, I think when I was there in '86, I was around the end of it. Mm -hmm. Because Donald Jones was there. Yeah. Donald Jones was there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Not sure. You couldn't have worked with him because you had your grandmother. Okay. Anyway, it was old. He probably maybe was just one of the waiters at that moment. My yeah. time, he was like the head of the dining room. Okay. That was good, Mark. Good. As long as it's it's informative and yeah, so they've got to do understand. It again. Something you you've got to learn. That's a common area. You've got to learn these things. I mean, whether or not you use them. Yeah. But so yeah, we're not we're knowledge. we're not going to try and make bakers out of you guys, but it's to give you a control and a handle on being able to bake. Some of these things, and like especially I say to the class, how do you write a menu if you don't have a grasp? Of yeah, this stuff, right. How do you how do you write a menu if you don't have grass and dessert and cakes and pies and, and cakes? Mm -hmm. You have to know these things. You want to write a menu as a chef, right? Mm -hmm. And also, like if you want to understand what it is you're, if you're the chef, what it is your baker, your pastry chef is doing or trying to communicate to you. So you have that understanding. Yes, they have the developed language. skill level and things like that. Right? Exactly. You gotta know the language. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Well, we have well after lunch we have time in between. And I have the gimbal. We can always try and see if that works oh, too right, with the phone, yeah. right? As just as an alternate angle, yeah. possibly, right? Or, yeah. or maybe set up the gimbal, the gimbal point, pointing down here or something, and yeah. we could piece yeah. things together. Yep. Yeah. Well, enough footage to play with. I'll become Hollywood movie producers. <laughs> Action! Can I say that one really start? Action! So I have to sign in today. I don't have a card because I'm a uh, adjunct. I'm, a term. I'm on a term, so I don't have a term. So I have to sign a form with a communal pen. Right? Communal pen. One side of this form, maybe the next side. That's not being you known all communal pen for that. So if that means, Chef, if I, if I get COVID now, I know I got it from you. 
Because I was, you were the last one who touched the pen before me. Everybody that came in used that pen. Just itching for a reason to fight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Crocs are too, they're too thin. Um, these are wood, these are wood. See, mine are a bit thicker than Chef Donald's. These, these are dance goes. And I had to get them closed because back where I worked at the research facility in ADM, for safety reasons, we're not allowed to have open shoes in the back, right? Because things could splatter on you and stuff like that. Right? I had a pair of dance yeah. for, uh, for these dance goes. Dance goes. Yeah. yeah. I had a pair when I was in camp and I got 20 bucks at a nurse's shop. This is a, and they were white. Yep. And I see the guys, uh, you know, the oil workers looking at me as I walk by with my white shoes. <laughs> yeah. And the nurses, I mean, a lot of European chefs wear white ones. Right. Yeah. Um, and you, you don't see it, but there's actually like a cut in here that helps it flex. Right. Um, so it's not, it, although it's, it's wood, like in, in the terms of the, it's solid, but it bends, right? And because it's so nice and thick, I mean, I've had these six years already. Yeah, right? long yeah. they last a long time. Right? I've, I've gone through, I've been doing this three, five years. I can probably count the clocks I've got, yeah. maybe eight, 10 set of clocks. And time. what I also find is like really good for your back because it helps your posture. Right? So, like, I don't have any back pain at all. And or then anything. you've got these and the other feature is you can pick them up. So, you're spilling hot grease or hot soup in the foot, bang your bottom. Yeah. What's that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, give yourself good shoes. It's imperative to take you so many hours in your. And you'll, you'll see in Europe, everybody, I mean, it's not just the chefs wearing clogs, it's anyone that's on their feet, doctors, nurses, dentists. Oh, yeah. I find the clogs a little too soft. And uh, for me, it's for my back. 
Watch yourself. What's the saying? When they're black, they're done, right? Yeah. Is everybody back yet? Okay. I'm just going to put them over We're here. Going here Zoe. No rush. Yeah, that uh, fan, uh, Chef Mark. Yep. I find that fan really hot. Right? And in the bottom floor, it's really high with fans. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit dark, but for artisan breads, it's not uncommon. Yeah. yeah. Um, So I'm just going to get them onto the screens to cool. Put this on the back for now. Okay, so for checking for doneness, um, well, obviously color, right? Well, like we say. When they're black, they're done. Right? Um, they're, these have gotten good color. They're not burnt. There's a little bit of darkness on one side here from the pan, especially where, where they blow bubbles, where it's really thin. It may go a bit darker. Right? Um, and a, you know, an experienced baker will simply take the loaf and tap either like, I like to just flick my finger or, or tap like this. You can hear how hollow it is. Right? And that takes a bit of experience to really understand what is hollow and what isn't as far as doneness, right? The best way to check that even though I'm experienced that I still like to do to this day is I like to use an instant read thermometer that is one that is very fast. Right? And you just stick it nicely in there. And I, I'm so used to being in the US and things that I, and a lot of bread bakeries, even in Canada, still use Fahrenheit, right? So that's one of the, baking is an old tradition and it's hard to change bakers, right? Um, so this is 208, right? So you wanna be above 200. Um, and so 208 is 97, 98 Celsius, right? So you, you wanna be above 95 Celsius basically, right? Is what you're shooting for. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, one is obviously is to unlock the starch so that the starch is all cooked so that it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not gummy and, and uncooked inside, right? Um, that's the most obvious one. The other one is important, especially with things where you're using sourdoughs, where you're using wild uh, yeast spores out of the air and things like that. Yeast that you buy, the instant yeast and stuff that we use in baking, that dies at 140 Fahrenheit, which is, uh, okay, minus 32 is 108 divided by two. So it's around 50 degrees uh, Celsius, right? <clears throat> um, and, but the, the wild yeast spores, they can survive much higher temperatures. They could survive temperatures up to 80, 85 degrees Celsius. And so that's why we need that higher temperature to ensure that it's baked through, that we kill all of that wild yeast. That's why baking in the cooking world, in the commercial world, uh, these types of baking processes and cooking processes are referred to as a kill step because that's when you kill all of the bacteria or the, the uh, basically those that, things that could be harmful, salmonella, all of these types of things. So, you know, it's like with all these scares with, with salmonella on, on um, romaine lettuce, for example, if we cooked romaine lettuce, it wouldn't be a scare because, it, you know, that's the whole problem is that it's on, it, when you have contamination on things you don't cook, there is no kill step. 
And so on things that you do cook properly, then there's nothing to worry about. That's why you see all these warnings always about eating beef uh, rare or medium rare is because you're not getting it high enough to kill all of the harmful bacteria that might be present. However, if all the rules are followed in processing of processing beef and pork, you have nothing to worry about. Uh, chicken, of course, still has to be cooked up to, uh, what is it, 80 Celsius? One, right? 180, uh, one, one, uh... 165 Fahrenheit, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, because of salmonella primarily, right? Um, and so that, that is how to check for doneness on that. So we're gonna let these cool for a little bit and then we can slice them open to compare with the ones that I, I made ahead. And where the principle, other than ovens, the, the principal difference is the flowers and you can already see the difference in lift, right? Um, and I baked these on a stone. These didn't even get baked on a stone. And you could see that's just because of the strength of the flour when you don't have all that much rye flour in there. It, it gives the dough a little bit more strength to, to rise up and things like that. So our um, baguette though has, has uh, risen a bit. Um, and so now we're doing what is referred to as the folding and stretching. And <clears throat> that is you, you grab the dough and you pull it up and fold it over on top of itself. Turn it 90 degrees, doesn't matter whether you turn clockwise or counterclockwise as long as you keep turning in one direction, okay? Um, and, and then you again, you, you grab it and you pull it up, you stretch it up and fold it over top of itself, right? And then again, stretching it up and over top of itself. And one more time, stretch and fold over top of itself. So as much as we might refer to this as a no knead bread, that is really a form of kneading is it because we're stretching and folding. What we're doing is we're helping to develop the gluten. We're getting fresh oxygen in, knocking some of the alcohol out because the, the alcohol starts to suffocate the yeast. The pH, if the yeast gets like in the sour, the reason we refresh as well is the pH, which means potential for hydrogen in that the that is so how acidity is measured, okay? The pH starts to drop and the lower the pH is, the bacteria can't grow because there's more hydrogen than there is oxygen and it needs oxygen to live, right? You always wanna think of yeast as just like tiny little human beings. They want food, they want warmth and they want water, right? And that, that's what we need as well, right? And so they always have to have that and, and oxygen obviously as well, right? So um, you your fat top, right? Uh, time, temperature, uh, moisture. Yep. And so I'm so just going to. When we study the bacteria, right? Salmonella and, and uh, uh, foodborne illnesses. Yep. How the, how, how the bacteria grow, what it needs to grow. So. Yeah, the difference is that with yeast, it's good bacteria, right? So that's what we're trying to accomplish there. So we're with that was our first fold. We're going to let this uh, rest and, and proof some more. I'm gonna accelerate that proofing a bit by putting it in back into the cabinet where it's nice and warm and humid. I still like to cover it anyway, even though it's humid at this stage, uh, just to make sure that it, it's, it doesn't skin over. Yeah, it's just the magnet's really strong, that's all. Okay, now we can go So now the, the, the auto lays on the sours had a chance to, to rest and absorb. So now I'm going to mix in the rest of that water. And it's a similar type of folding process uh -huh, and yes. that I'm just sort of scooping it and folding it to the, to the middle the whole time. Well, that's fantastic, yes. So you're just, you're, you're, you're uh, that auto leaves it just going right through the whole uh, dough mixture. Yep. Uh -huh. And so now that I have the water Beautiful. worked in, now I want to add in my salt so I can get the salt nicely distributed. So salt is, is, is very important. Um, it, uh, as we've, we've mentioned a couple times already, is that it is used to regulate fermentation. 
Okay, so we don't want it in too soon because the osmotic pressure will harm the yeast or steal the water away from all the gluten. You had a question or a comment? I just want to make note of the way they salt it, and it's the same when you're seasoning anything. Jeff Mark started that process of dividing the salt e e evenly by distributing the salt evenly. You can just dump it into the, the bowl and hope that. No. Same your seasoning, guys. Same, same yeah. Now, there are recipes where you can mix the salt with the flour and everything because there's a whole lot more going on, like I do with my Cusantos, which was a separate uh, thing. Um, but for something like this, because it, there's so few ingredients, you want to be even more cautious because the, the chemical interactions are so complex. Right? Um, I was just telling Chef uh, this morning, I have a poster. Um, I'll try and get, I'll, I'll email it to you, whatever it is. I don't have the, the full big version, but enough that you can read it all. And it's just called the chemistry of bread. And you can see all the different interactions that happen just in this in the basic bread baking process, right? It's it's quite interesting. And so we're gonna mix the, the salt in here. Mm, this smells lovely. It does look it mm -hmm. looks lovely, Chef. If you like sour, it smells like. <laughs> and I love it, you know, it's moving off the side of the bowl as it should. Yep. You've got uh, control of that dough fully, I can see, you know. And you so now I'm, I'm, I love watching the technique. Yeah, I'm turning it also so that that seam kind of goes on the bottom now. And now like the, uh, now I'm starting the fermentation process, like with the baguette, so, uh, I'm going to put this into the proofer to allow it to get nice and warm and rise. And then we'll do the stretching and folding with that as well. Is there something you're looking for right there? You just feel that you've got everything incorporated. That everything's pulling and, and you can, you see, you'll get like this, see how it has that bounce to it so that you've created some of that tension, right? Um, and just making sure, of course, that the salt is well mixed in, right? Um, that everything's nicely mixed in. And it's got that little bit of, of bounce to it. Uh, and that makes it just, you know, it's just, it's, you know, there's one of these things when you, if you enjoy making bread and if you've, you, once you've made it a few times, it feels right. I, I don't know how to otherwise, it's just, you know, it just, it feels really good, the dough. Like you could, you could feel when you got a, a dough that has a good mixture and, and the right amount of protein and things that it just, it's gonna turn out nice, right? This also has a little bit less whole wheat flour than this one. So, but these will, um, well, maybe we can just shortcut it. Normally you would retard these overnight before uh, baking. So allow the protease enzymes to develop and um, so that it gives the, the bread the ability to really extend well in the oven. But maybe we'll just try and bake these off at the end of the day today, just to kind of see the differences, how they turn out, right? Um, because we won't be back here tomorrow to do this, obviously. Right, right. right. Uh, so uh, that's what we find. You guys are Wednesday, Thursday, right? You know that? Uh, no, Thursday, Friday. I'm oh, sorry, Thursday, Friday. Thursday, Friday. Right? Thursday, Friday. Just testing you, see if you're paying yeah, attention. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's a cheap one. <laughs> yeah, I just started researching for a battery for mine because I'd rather pay $70 for a new battery than buy a new laptop right so you now. Have a Mac. Tell me, you have a Mac. No, no, I have a no, I have a Toshiba PC. Yeah. So the folds you were doing first, I, uh, you did with the with the uh, baguette dough. Baguette, yes. Yep. Was there a specific amount of folds you did before you set it in the You want you want to do at least four, but you want you want to make sure that you've had a chance to go all the way around once or twice to get fresh oxygen in and to get like some of the gas out, right? Okay. Um, without pounding it too much, right? right. Because we we want to get some of those irregular cells developing, right? So similar thing now with the, with the focaccia. This has had a chance to, to rest. And this also needs the salt worked in, right? 
So this is the, again, this is, we're just still at the, the autolase stage, right? So now we're kneading the salt in, and then it's the, the bulk fermentation process. And again, he, he started that process, right? By spreading it on, you're not just dumping the salt in this pot, so let's just pour it. Oh yeah, see, even just by sitting that half hour or so, it already the gluten is starting to develop. You can right? see it. Yeah. And that's what we talked about in the pop pastry. Remember, you see your pop pastry is almost starting to rise and without you because you were working that so much, the gluten was coming through in the in the dough. Well, so you guys are making puff pastry too? They're, they're, they're going to do, they're finished their puff pastry. Everyone here finished their puff pile of rolls? You didn't finish it. You finished it. No, we didn't want to figure out how much you want to bring it back. Or a third of Oh, yeah, check out. Yeah, third of the line. Oh, yeah, you should be fine. I know, uh, Chef, uh, do you freeze your puff pastry, Chef? Be, be, How do you shape it? Yeah, it's 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 advantageous to freeze it before you bake it. Right. You get a little bit better rise, right? Get more consistent rise. I, 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 that's something I didn't know. So, and and do you do you uh, shape it first and then freeze it? Yes. yes. Yeah. So you roll your croissants or, or your Danish cups or whatever you're doing and spray it up to freeze it then. So that's interesting. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll play with your recipe there and see what we know. So yeah, what seems to happen with the freezing before baking and, and when research, when we're, we're doing it, we're just doing plain puff pastry without any fillings or anything. Um, and there we're going straight from the freezer directly to the oven. And what seems to happen is that the water starts to thaw and produce the steam faster um, that way to, to get better separation of the layers, right? So crystallizes and then melts into Yes, steam. yeah, because as it freezes, the water starts to crystallize out. So then it, it melts easier or quicker in producing the steam uh, in the baking process, right? Um, and we would, um, we would measure things uh, based on height as a big, one of the big measurements of um, when we were doing research, right? Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, this is the focaccia. So now it, we're starting the, the resting and folding process here as well. And so I'm going to put this one in the proofer too. And, um, and as things are resting and proofing, that's when I'll, I'll fill in some more information for you and try not to be too monotone. So um, but just on the theme of puff pastry, just to, you know, if you're interested. Is, so as I worked, mentioned to you, I worked in a research facility. So things often, we were doing research on puff pastry one time. And if you think it's challenging making one puff pastry dough, um, we worked with a customer who was basically, um, let me back this up a little bit. Um, have you all heard of trans fat? You've heard about that. So you've heard that trans fat has been now banned. It's like in terms of creating artificial trans fats. Right? What that means is that um, in the past, partially hydrogenated shortenings is where trans fats are created. What happens is that fats are made up of a glycerin backbone. Um, so the molecule has glycerin and then it has three fatty acid chains. Okay. Fatty acid chains can be different carbons long. And when they are unsaturated, then they have these bonds in them um, that make it kink so that the chain is not straight. So this way, when it tries to crystallize, because they're, they're not lining up nice and straight, they can't. So soybean oil or canola oil, for example, is very low in saturated fat. It's mostly unsaturated fat. So they can't crystallize very easily unless you make it really cold. Like when you freeze it, then it starts to, it pushes them close enough together that it starts to crystallize. Whereas if you have more saturated fat like butter, 
Butter has a lot of saturated fat. Saturated fat is where the carbon is, chain is nice and long and straight so that then they can nicely connect together. So what trans fat would do is that they would basically process the fat with a um, nickel catalyst to and add hydrogen to it, right? And that hydrogen gas with the nickel catalyst would take that double bond where the kink is and move one of those bonds to the opposite side. And trans is Latin means opposite or other side, right? And so instead of cis bonds, which means same sided bonds, right? Um, if you have that trans bond on the opposite side, and then it makes that nut chain nice and straight so that we could make unsaturated fat like canola oil into shortening. Um, and so now by banning that, now you have to use blends of enzymatically or in chemically intersterified fats. In the Europe, they use a lot of chemically intersterified. In North America, it's primarily enzymatic. Um, enzymatic means it's a lipid enzyme that goes, the, the fat is uh, transferred over a column of these enzymes. They look like uh, little uh, sand granules or something, right? And the enzyme basically disconnects some of those bonds and rearranges them so that in another way, it makes fats thicker, right? Not completely saturated, um, but to some extent a little bit, right? Um, so it helps thicken it up to, to create that sort of similar process. Right? And then you mix it with hard fats that are fully saturated, like a palm kernel oil that is, that is fully saturated or a fully hydrogenated fat. If the fat is fully hydrogenated and all of the, the trans fatty acids are saturated, there are no trans, right? It's just all saturated fatty acids, right? But it's hard as a rock, it's like wax, right? It won't, when you put it in your mouth, it won't melt. It, it, it's, and so, but you have to blend those and then get them to crystallize and find the right kind of melting and softening points. So the reason I go through all that preamble is just to give you an understanding is that those different blends are going to handle differently. And for something like puff pastry, where it's really important to have those equally layered layers, because when you did all your lamination, you produce 145 layers of dough and 144 layers of fat. That's and you, a seven you, fold, right, Jeff? Oh, that's for that's for two singles, two doubles. Two singles, two doubles. So yep. we do. Uh, they, yeah, that's the, the or the other the seven fold that we do. Okay. Single, single, it begins with a single end. Okay. Yeah. So then, then you might have more fat too, because the more folds you do, the more fat you have to have in it to to be able to stretch it all those layers, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, there's some that like in, in French, it's, you know, if you've heard of the dessert, they say mil foy, uh, means, means a thousand leaves, because the, the, what, some of the old traditional methods of folding it, you produce 500 layers of, of dough and 500 layers of fat. Right? Um, and, but you gotta, you have very high amount of fat in something That's like right. that too, right? And Jeff, uh, did you just see the Canadian uh, dairy got nailed for using palm, uh, oil in their butter? Um, no, that's it. What, what, what's under discussion on that is, is that they are, they're not using palm oil in the butter. They're using palm oil in the cow. It goes into the cows. Right. But it's, it's somewhat, it sounds somewhat dubious because the digestion system of the cow would probably rearrange the, the fatty acids so much that little to nothing of any of the palm saturates would be left, right? So the perception that the butter is harder not sure. I, it's you know, but yes, the feed can affect it, right? But I doubt it's the palm oil alone, right? Just another um, quick point on, on that was that uh, Chef Todd, were you guys involved in this? Chef Todd was weighing the uh, uh, weighing the four hundred fifty four grams of uh, of lard, mm -hmm. coming up with four hundred twenty five grams every time. Four twenty five, four thirty, missing between twenty five and thirty grams. On every wow. Time. So your recipes, and that's what he was doing. We were making the dough with that, we were making our meaty dough, and we were, every, everyone, it was dry. Everyone was dry. It was very strange because all the recipes were bang on all the other recipes. Jeff Todd did a little investigating there and found that that learned was 25 uh, grams short. Yeah, um, that can happen. Um, 
There's, there is a, an allowance that they have. That seems like a bit high. There's an allowance plus and minus. Um, I find that butter is usually between four, usually around 452, right? It says 454 on the package, yeah. but it's usually a couple grams short, right? I always weigh it. I mean, that's, that's a habit, right? Um, and, uh, you know, unless it's something where, the, where five or 10 grams disappearance isn't going to matter. Um, but otherwise, always I always prefer to weigh it, right? I always check weight, things like that. Um, even like, say, if it's a quart of cream, I, I measure it still. I, I still, or a liter, I still weigh it or measure it because packaging is not always perfect, right? Um, that's, that's a yeah. very interesting, that's a whole topic in itself. Yeah. So you're claiming you're it's cream, you're claiming it's butter, even though it says the measurement on the stick or it says one liter, Jeff is going through the process because it's such a science. Going through the process of being that exact. That oh yeah, like on a, on a 20 kilo bag of flour, you're allowed up to a hundred gram variance. Well, there you right? go. So it's go somewhere. which which on 20 kilos, it's not that much. But now if you were making a production situation where you were using five bags of flour, and now you would be 500 grams short if they were all if each bag was short weight for some reason. So that's why it's important to always still weigh. And not just go by the bag itself, right? Um, but yeah, so getting back to our puff pastry is so the research we were doing was was on blending these different fats. And fats go through or shortenings or even margarines and butters. They go through a churning type system that is uh, in the oil industry they call it votation. It's basically a, 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 a almost like an ice cream chiller in a way. Is like the, to blend the fats, they all have to be melted. And then they get pumped into a machine where it is chilled um, and sometimes using salt, sometimes using ammonia. Um, and so there's a, a barrel that scrapes it off and then it goes into another chamber where it's massaged with what they call a pin worker. It's basically like a, a shaft with pins on it and gets blended and then it gets chilled maybe some more and blended again. And then it gets pumped out and it allows to, to set and finish crystallizing. Um, and so, the oil experts, the team on the oil experts, they came up with 12 different blends of oil that the customer wanted to test. And so, and then there was the standard, the control, the way, what, the way they, the fat that they currently use. So we had to make 13 dough. Fat. Yeah, which had trans fat in it, yeah. So we had 13 different fat systems and we couldn't just make them all ahead and do them as we had time. They all had to be done successively with the same amount of crystallization time because that's how the customer processed it as well, right? The way, the same way as in their production run. So we made a one kilo dough each time and we made all 13 doughs in one day. And so you have to keep track of which one has to get folded when because they each have to have a 20 minute rest between folds, right? Now we didn't have to roll it by hand. Right. That was the one. We had, we had a reversible dough sheeter, but still it was two of us right. just doing the puff pastry, mixing the dough and, you know, like um, then calling Brian down in the, in the Votator, okay, the dough's done. We're ready when you are. Yeah. He would uh, extrude the fat, send it down to us. We'd start, uh, lam you know, shaping it and then laminating and everything. And so, and then we, we cut all the doughs and what we would make, we would make five inch squares and we would make uh, patty shell rings, like just the rings, right? Uh, with a metal a stainless steel uh, tube in the center that's got sprayed with fat and they all get frozen. And then the next day they all get baked and we then measure the height of them and we measure the volume. Um, to measure the volume, because puff pastry is so delicate, we had a, uh, a machine that measures it with laser. So it goes on a platform, it's mounted, on a, on a spike and the platform rotates and the laser comes down, it knows where the, the top is. And then it goes down one millimeter at a time as it rotates and it captures also an image of it and gives you the volume, it weighs it, gives you the specific volume, all of these calculations. And we would get the, the best one we did that the customer then selected, we had a five millimeter thick pastry dough. And we knew it was five millimeters because we could set five millimeters on the sheeter, right? Okay, in our reduction process. And from five millimeters, they were then 82 millimeters tall when they were baked. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. So it's that, that, that was a beautiful, you know, not only good laminating, but good laminating fat. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's, it was basically that, and, and some of them were much smaller. Some of them didn't rise well at all, right? So you could see just the difference the fat makes, right? Um, um, Amazing. And, and so, you know, having said that, there's, that's kind of also leads into saying what, what Jeff was saying earlier is that there's all kinds of opportunities from uh, once you've got your culinary degree and getting experience and things in which direction you want to go, there is, uh, you could check on www.culinology.org, C-U-L-I-N-O-L-O-G-Y. Dot org, and that is the Research Chef Association. And the Research Chef Association created the term colonology, and they uh, patent it, they own it, and you can get certifications. You can get certified as a certified research chef, which 80% cool. uh, of the questions are food science and 20% are culinary or you can get certified as a certified culinary scientist where 80% of the questions are um, food, uh, culinary, food sci culinary questions and 20% are food scientists. So we get people from the food science side of the world coming into food development and product development and get certified as a culinary, uh, uh, certified culinary scientist and we get chefs who want to learn more about food science and learn that, and they become a certified research chef, right? a CRC. Right? Um, and the food science questions are not easy, right? Um, and there's there's a lot to learn there. Um, but it's it, you learn that also through experience. And there are study groups and, and things. And uh, there's um, a professor out in California who does a whole bunch of the classes all online so that you can, uh, and, I, and they're fairly reasonable. I don't remember the cost off the top of my head, uh, but Jill Golden is her name. And uh, she's really, really great. She's very helpful uh, because you need to know, you need to learn things like um, you know, the composition of proteins and how many different amino acids there are and the names of those amino acids and, and things like that, because right? We, we kind of mm -hmm. this need that we're always telling you guys that, uh, you know, baking is the science and cooking is not, not it really is. There's a lot of science involved in, in, in the culinary side. Of yeah. It. It's not as specific as we need to be, but it's there. It's there. You and you you utilize a lot of it, and and uh, um and I mean you guys have a lot of the tools here already for that. It's really like I mean I see that you have the uh, um the Forbeck the thermal mix the thermal right mixer, yeah. um the, you know and you have the rationale ovens and things like that and. And these are already really good quality uh, tools that you, you don't see as commonly in North America in a lot of kitchens today, right? I mean, it's more so it's growing, um, but not everybody wants to spend the money not realizing the gains and, and uh, productivity and everything else that you get as well. Um, but so mentioning that is, is not, to dis, uh, not to scare you, it's to encourage you in that there's, there's plenty you can do with this knowledge and then grow that. And, focus in on certain areas. Um, I had a TA while I, I was also doing some teaching um, at the uh, community college in Decatur, Illinois at Richland Community College. And I had a um, teacher's assistant, a TA from the second year. And, um, you know, we chatted as he would set up for me and things like that. And uh, I had fairly, what I call large classes. I had often 12 students. And so we would have everything pre-weighed for all of the students. It's a different system where it was demo and do, demo and do, demo and do in a four hour class, right? Um, and um, uh, and so uh, Joe would set everything up for me and he's a research chef now for a company north of Chicago, right? Um, he started off there as a uh, cook's assistant and things and worked his way up and he's their research chef now and, and uh, he loves it and it's to each his own. Some people just love being on the line and and being in a kitchen and that's what they'll do it. And that is actually great, you know, it's a great living, you can enjoy it, but it's just to, to give you, you know, understanding there's, there's other opportunities oh, as yeah. well, right? There's so many avenues, right? Um, it can be very product development focused in something like say a McDonald's or something 
like McDonald's is launching a brand new cinnamon bun that's coming out. And their culinary team leader, they call them. Yeah. On Tim Hortons, yep. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. just basically, there are other opportunities there other than, you know, hotels or restaurants or yeah. convention centers. But there's a whole sort of nine to five there mm -hmm. that's available. So it's interesting. Yeah, and they, and like Tim Hortons has a beautiful R&D center in uh, Oakville area. Um, really oh, nice, right? And that's what they're yeah. doing. They're, yeah. You know, even you're looking, have you guys heard of El Bolle? You know El Bolle? El Bolle was the top restaurant in the world for many years. Chef uh, uh, and and Antoine Fernandez. Yep, mm -hmm. something like that. Yep. Uh, he would close down for six months. Close down for six months, he'd bring in a bunch of scientists, and that's what they, that's how they developed the menu. How am I able to serve a warm gel? So he put a scientist to work. Okay, I'm gonna warm. How do I do that? I've got a set for it. It's cold. It can't be warm. So. These are the kind of things. So science does come into play in a big, big way, especially with this new uh, modern cuisine. It's very much in the forefront. No, Adrian Ferrara was his Ferrara, name. Ferrara, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Andreas Ferrara. Yeah. Ferrara. Yeah. So uh, all kinds of science, again, especially this new cuisine, this modern molecular cuisine. Mm -hmm. It's even in the name, molecular yeah. cuisine. Anyway. Yeah, and uh, Heston, um, what was his last name now? Heston. The fat duck? Yeah, the fat duck. He yeah. was basically the guy who started the That's whole right. molecular gastronomy you know, thing. Uh, there's a restaurant called Heston Blumenthal. Blumenthal. Yes, in, in yeah. London. And uh, if you watch his if you watch his vlogs or his uh, he's got a TV show on and stuff, it's all science. Everything he does is great science, breaks it down to the back. But again, I digress. But uh, science is everywhere. I spoke to you today. This is it. It is everywhere. It's everywhere. Okay, I'm going to give the, um, the, the, the doughs each another fold, and then we're going to cut open some bread. So with my, my baguette, I can go in just with a glove and you can really see it's really starting to get some stretch. We're doing time wise. And I'm just going to let that rest back in the proofer for a few minutes before I divide and shape them. Um, best would be they would get one more fold, but in the interest of time, I want to be able to finish shaping them and, and bake them off for you this morning as well. Right? Now the sourdough, is really a very wet dough. So what we want to do there is you want to dip your hand in water and keep it wet so that you see then it doesn't stick to your hand, right? Because otherwise it's super sticky. Very good trick. Very good trick. And so we're doing the same thing here. We're folding. And so normally the, the final proof of, after they're shaped of letting them rest overnight is all part of getting a slow proof. It's more flavor development. Um, and as I mentioned, there's enzymes such as protease enzymes who then go to work on relaxing the gluten so that it allows them to, to stretch more, even more as it bakes and things. 
um, and gives you a more open uh, cell structure that way. Jeff, is it a, is it a, uh, is it a more structured dough that you get from, this, from the uh, root birth than you would just leaving it out of room temperature? Yes, you, you, you'll get a little more even cell structure. You get a more rapid rise, right? Um, and in a proofer, you might also need to put more yeast sometimes. Like you'll, you'll see some of the more commercial breads is that you'll have a higher yeast level than, than what we're doing. And the more fat or sugar you have is more yeast too, right? Um, <clears throat> because of the, again, the... Sugar produces, Well, the, the yeah, the, uh, the, um, the fat interferes with, uh, it, it has a, an effect of uh, harming the yeast, like it's slowing it down. Um, and, and sugar is similar to salt in a sense, it's like osmotic pressure. It's stealing the water away from the yeast. The so the more sugar you have in the dough, the slower the fermentation the will be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The opposite. So when you have high fat and high sugar doughs, like a brioche dough, um, you'll use a lot more yeast. Right? Um, like I do a brioche dough, the one I've been making for the market, uh, where I'm getting about 32 buns, uh, is about three kilos of dough, and it gets, um, I think it's 40 grams of ye instant yeast. So uh, that's pretty high level, where, whereas comparison, um, actually, I think it's 45 grams, yeah. So whereas a cosanto, for example, that's very lean, I only have 15 grams of yeast. Yeah. Um, because I don't have it competing, don't have all that sugar and everything competing. So similar, my focaccia is a little bit sticky too. So I'm going to dip my hands in water as I'm folding this. And this would be very similar when you say wet those uh, focaccia, ciabatta. Yep. Wet, these are two of the wetter doughs. Yes, high hydration. High hydration. Yep. High hydration. yep. So that's a higher percentage of water uh, to the flour. Like if you look in some of these artisan bread groups, the people they talk about going uh, 90 and 100% hydration. Um, so that's equal amounts. Equal amounts of water and flour. Wow. Yeah. Um, in trying to achieve certain characteristics of, of an open crust inside. And it's very difficult to deal with, much more difficult to deal Much with more difficult to handle, this. yep. So the, one of the reasons you, when you see ciabatta buns, they're often just these little square pillows is because that's the easiest format to handle them in. And uh, in terms of, you know, put stretching the dough out and just cutting them into squares. Because if you try to round or shape them in any way, they're just so sticky and difficult to handle, right? Um, and so they're usually quite often just uh, kind of the dough just left to kind of spread out and cut it off into squares and just lay those squares spaced on a pan and, and bake them off. And chipata literally in, in um, Italian, it means slipper bread. So the idea is that it's supposed to be completely kind of hollow inside and light, like, like putting your shoe into a slip, your foot into a slipper, right? Um, so that type of thing. Interesting, yes. Okay, um, where would I find a cutting board? Oh, there, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Cool. So let's cut some bread. So you can see it's got a nice open structure, somewhat irregular.
And so this has sort of a gray crumb to it as well because of the uh, dark rye flour that was added. I'm gonna cut it this way so we can see the cell structure the other way as well. So you can hear the crust, right? So you could already see, see how open that is. And all, all the only difference between these two really is that this has no rye flour in it. That's, that's the main difference, other than, of course, the oven or things like that. But um, with these, those differences are not going to be as great as the impact of the, of the rye flour alone. This is lovely stuff. Do you have a couple of paper plates or something that we can pass around the bread? Right down there. Right Perfect. Yeah. Hold on. I have to run. Okay, we'll get that. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. I'll, I'll get that to you. Okay. Yeah. So please take a piece and pass it around. That's the, the one containing the rye that was baked off yesterday. And this is the one we baked this morning. Oh yeah. Sorry, chef. Oh, paper cups. Or something? You need something? No. Oh, I was just wondering what she was looking for. So this is the the one baked off yesterday. Okay. With the rye in it. Yeah. And this has no rye in it. And that's the one we baked off in the, this morning. So you could do just the, just by not having the rye flour, how it changes yes, the structure. Yeah, the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So this is the rye, obviously. No, this is the, oh, rye. This is the rye. And that's why it's so gray as well, right? Oh, I'm seeing. And the, this uh, is more open. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the brown is the is the, the whole wheat that oh, I had I in the sour. I right? see that. It's uh, <clears throat> a little more dense. Mm -hmm. Slightly denser and, you know, obviously gray in color. Changes the flavor a little bit, of course, too. Oh. Lovely, huh? Homemade bread even makes you really sick, You know that, right? It's not a 
around? Yeah, bread, big bread or cookies or muffins would make the house. Nothing like, it, right? nothing like that. And for those who love to do it, this is lovely shot. This is lovely. So you can see, especially when the in the bite, without the rye flour, you get more open, lighter texture. And it's a little bit different flavor. There's more, there's a little bit more of a sour note to the ones with the rye in it. Yeah, there is a little bit more. Oh, yeah. What would you eat? Anything. <laughs> I'm good. You don't need much, um, so right? Sorry, a little mm -hmm. butter, a little cultured butter or fresh butter or something. It's really good with um, things that are fatty, like cured meats, um, cheeses, things like that, because the sour, the acidity goes really well with breaking down those fat notes in your, in your mouth and stuff like that. Um, you really don't even but, butter, right? You know, so, today, these days, it's like, you know, it's almost anything goes in that respect. I mean, I mean even with peanut butter, it's good, right? Um, I, I like to toast it and, you know, warm, put the smear the peanut butter on is really good, right? Um, I just like, also like it just with playing with butter too, uh, as Chef Donald has mentioned. Um, we've been doing uh, things like this and, and a brioche and this is something like this is what I have in mind for the farmer's market when, uh, to be able to make ahead and freeze while I'm away is to, to do something different than an English muffin for eggs Benedict, to have some toasted sourdough, just a slice of sourdough toasted, and then, you know, the, uh, the egg. Right now, the, uh, right now we're doing them on the, uh, on the roshi. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. Just because with, with Callum gone and me gone, we're trying to figure yeah, out ways you, to make your life easy. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we've got that. Let me just put these here for if you want to take a look, closer look at all at any point. So the, so the message to me here is the, 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 the science is very, very complex. But the, like Chef Mark said, when it's all said and done, it's flour, water, yeast. And salt. Yeah. You know? So it, it really breaking down into the simplest form, that's what it is. But if you look deep, you can go very, very, very deep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, let's shape the uh, baguettes here so that we can allow them to proof a little bit. So you can see it's it's risen up again already. Here, I think. Yeah, I just think we're out of water too. I don't want to yank it because your laptop there. I mean, it, you can, I guess, but it's very, very difficult to, to do anything without a proof or if you're big operations. Oh, if it's a bigger operation, yes. I mean, it's difficult without a proof. Or, I mean, we're trying to, even at the farmer's market, we're trying to get by without a proof or, um, and trying to proof uh, uh, croissants and things that, and, and brioche and stuff for baking there. And it's just really hard to keep up. Um, because the, the, there is a proof setting on one of the ovens 
but we can only fit two trays in there at a time and it tends to overheat all the time. So I always have a, I have a thermometer that I carry with me always. Um, and I brought it for today just in case, because I didn't know if the cabinet has a thermostat on it or not. Because some people, all they have is just like a, a box with a, a boiler plate in it, right? And so this one, I can set it up um, with min-max alarms. And I, I hang the probe uh, in the oven. Um, and so that way, if it gets over 96, it starts to beep. So then I, I turn the heat off on the oven and open the door for a little while. If it gets down to 82, it beeps again. So then I close the door and there's still enough residual heat in there that it actually starts to warm up again. And so it's a little game I have to play there yes. um, because with croissants, you don't want it too hot because it melts the butter otherwise, right? So if it's a hundred degree proofer like we use for bread, that's not good for croissants because it will, it will melt the butter and the butter starts to leak out and give you greasy croissants um, instead of making them nice and flaky. If you're just doing stuff at home, it's, you can just, like I said, for, for one or two loaves of bread, you can use a, just warm the oven up slightly or put a pot of hot water inside of it just to get it warm and humid. Um, it's just finding a warm, humid place. I mean, I, I, we rented a condo for a while where they had a, a heated floor system and there was, a, um, there was a, a cabinet where like a little utility room where the heater was and everything and the water heater. And it was always 85 to 90 degrees in there, right? So I, I literally, I took a, I opened a step ladder and put some boards on there. And that was my proofing cabinet, right? I mean, you sort of, you, you improvise, right? Um, uh, because yes, to buy something like this brand new, they're anywhere from six to $12,000, right? Um, if you want a retarder on it, um, which is refrigeration unit so that you can, it'll refrigerate overnight and automatically come on and warm they're probably closer to the $20,000 range, right? um, which I've been trying to convince Pauline to buy, right? right, right. <laughs> yeah. There's also, you know, you'll find spots in your own kitchen where it's a little hotter up, buy something there, top yeah. of your fridge. Usually you get a lot of heat from the back of the fridge, right? A lot of heat from that element. So there's places you can find in your kitchen that work. That I, I Pardon me? Yes, sometimes the, some of the bottom ovens, the way they, the original, the drawer was designed as a warming bin, right? So yes, it can be warm, but there again, if you, know, if you have the oven on, I would put a thermometer in there or I would check it because you, you don't want it to get too hot, right? Because don't forget at 140, the yeast is dead and it won't come back, right? It's, it's gone, right? So that's an important um, number to remember, right? Yeah. 40 to 140. Yeah. And, and once you get over 100 degrees, the yeast, the fermentation actually slows down, okay? Because it's, it's like, imagine, I don't well, you guys probably have not traveled to the Caribbean much, but, you know, imagine a hot summer day. You don't want to run fast. Yeah. You want to go slow and take it yeah. easy. So does the yeast. So does the bacteria. It gets too hot. It gets too uncomfortable. It doesn't want to do any work, right? Um, and uh, so it's, it's keeping those, those things in, in mind that way too. Um, I mean, just like Chef Donald mentioned, I worked in a pastry shop once where one of the, we did very little fermented goods, which is Danish pastries and, and uh, some uh, buns for, for sandwiches and things like that. But I had to make like two, three dozen buns every day. And the place was freezing half the time. And we had a deck oven in there too. But so once we turned the oven on in the morning and I had a shelf above me and that's what I did is literally I, I would put the, the buns and everything up there in the highest spot I could get because that's where all the warm air was, right? To, to be able to proof it. And you look, you actually look for those spots. You try and find the spots in the kitchen where that works because there's also things like get mushrooms, you take a bunch of mushrooms, you must be your own mushrooms. Trade them up and find that the warmer spot of the kitchen thing. It's really just a, it, that's the kind of game you play. In the Wasn't it three hundred? Yeah. Look at the next one over. 
Yep, 300 foot. Or maybe it was only two. I thought it was three. Yes, it's only two. Yeah. Okay. So we want to first round them before we, we shape them. Um, now, as a baker, I would just round it quickly, like usually with two hands, but I'm just going to show you one at a time. So what I'm doing is, is I'm creating a seam on the bottom and creating the tension on top so that it gathers on the bottom and has that tension on top. And then I want to let it rest for a couple of minutes. Oh, could you get me a small bowl with some flour, please? Yeah. So to show you that it is, is a little bit like the folding we're doing, only you're, you're folding it into the bottom. So one way of doing this in the beginning is to um, get the sticky part down and then just pull it towards you, okay? And then use a hand to push it around and then pull it towards you again. You see how it's, it's tucking it down underneath and then you turn it and pull it towards you. Push it away and pull it towards you and push it away and pull it towards you. So that's the same thing I'm doing with this, only I'm doing the tucking with one hand and the pushing away with the other. But you could do it with both hands, like pulling it towards you, pushing it away and then pulling it towards you again. So again, the same thing, you're creating this tension, so it has a little bit of tension there, and that you have the seam all on the bottom. You'll see these guys in sharp parts out that I'm sure as well. Uh, they'll have three in each hand. No, I can only do one in each hand. One? Okay, well, you're a little bit of practice. But I'm thinking of the guys I worked with, one of my Kevin Smith, I've watched mm -hmm. him with Three buns. Yeah. Uh, and then, so you usually want to give them a good 10 minute rest or so. And that's just to help relax the gluten. But now we're going to shape them into baguettes. Um, and so I'm going to seam up. I, I flipped it upside down. Seam up. okay. yep. So you want to seam up. And then you fold from the top down to the middle. And I use the ball of my hand to press it in. And you can either fold from the bottom up or turn it around and again, fold it top down to the middle. Some people like to use their fingertips. You can do that as well. Basically, you want to make sure you attach it nicely. And then just keep folding now from the top to the middle, the top to the middle, and the top to the middle till it's all closed up. And again, you have that, that tension there. And now you just apply gentle pressure while rolling it out to get that shape. And you may not get it right away all at once because of that tension, so you don't want it to tear. So you can always just dust the table a little bit, set it aside for a moment, go to the next one. And let it relax a little. Right? Works better on a wooden bench than a, <laughs> a soft, flexible stainless steel table. how much it rested when you put those two together out. Yep, and uh, oh, somebody watched it, excellent, thank you. I'm spraying them because I don't know these pans. So I don't know how well they may or may not stick. So I'd rather play it safe. Just getting that ready. That was one of my confusing slides. Don't worry about a little overkill with some spray and some flour on your 
bins. Nine out of time, ten times it might come out, but you need that ten time. And, and pies often it's it's less to worry about because there's so much fat in the pie dough, it usually works out fine. And so now the second time, I'm as I'm folding, I'm also stretching it slightly. And it, you don't need to press too hard. You I mean you know some firmness there, but you you don't want to like. It's not like going to the gym and working out and and you're not bench pressing hundred pounds or something like that, right? Um, because if you press too hard, it will start to rip. You can see how it keeps pulling back. Now you want to find your seam. And then the easiest way is to kind of lay your fingers across and then flip it onto your hand. And then you can transfer it into the pan. Just gently pulling as it just as as much as it will give me without pulling too hard. And this rolling process also helps you even it out so that you can see, well, hey, I'm a little bit thick here. Let me press a little bit more there and just kind of get that all nice and even as much as I can. Try to find your seam, flip it onto your fingers and into the pan. And so we're gonna let those proof for a while. Let's see if I can still fit them into the timeline to get them baked. They take about 20 minutes. Yeah, it's gonna be, you might have to come back after lunch or something. <laughs> it's a different group as well. Yeah. So you get the benefit of all this. They don't get that. I didn't. I didn't think to prepare that way. Yeah, right, right. I, I was just so focused on one class. Yeah, that one is wet, hey? Yep. And then you share it again, huh? Yeah, so that I'm not taking yeah, yeah. the flour into account. And so these. We're weighing these around 625, 630, that's good. I'll take it.
So I try to weigh these out, you know, they're because they're so sticky, it's hard to, to be too fussy with the little amounts. So I'm going for about 630. So I got three of them at 630 and I have a little piece left over. Now I could use this little piece either as a Levin into another dough, or I just simply eyeball this into three to even, so the, even it out. And so I'm using the, the banneton and okay. I want to just lightly mist it, not soaking wet, but just so that it's lightly misted. And I like to use dark rye flour. I find because it's a little bit finer particle size, um, the way it sticks. Um, and it just, it looks nice afterwards too. And so just put heavily the, the, the flour in there. And then just as if you were, um, you know, flouring a cake pan, just rotate it and gently tap it to get it nicely coated everywhere. Knocking off some of the excess. I would have went right to spray with that, right? And that natural thing that I thought to do, but water makes sense. Is it straight up water in that bird? Just straight up water, yep. It's so useful to have a little spray bottle of water for many different things, especially to, to make steam in your oven at home or um, like if you want to refresh some, some, some breads or croissants or something out of the freezer or something, just you spray them with some um, water and put them in a hot oven and the water steams on them a bit. And that way they'll be just like fresh afterwards. Yeah, that is an old trick too, yeah. And you see Chef Rodney does that to save a lot of berries on hand there. And water. So, and this is that same kind of folding motion to create a seam. This is started this way first, and then again, that same idea of pulling it towards yourself and pushing it away and pulling it towards yourself. And the difference in the end with these is we proof them upside down. That is, you put them with the, the nice taut side into the banneton. Right. Okay. And now you want to dredge it with, uh, again, either flour or rye flour. I like to use the cream of wheat on top, and then it will, it gets the cover so that it can breathe a little bit. And then it goes into the refrigerator. And ideally you would refrigerate this overnight and let it um, come up to room temperature for an hour and then bake it in a hot oven like we did earlier today, right? right so Thursday, Friday, Thursday, Friday, we have those two days, right? So that's the goal there that, uh, you got to do, yeah. do sourdough. And, you sure. Yeah, and you can, you can prep your sourdough, get your poolish and your biga and everything on Thursday. And then Friday, you can make the baguettes and the focaccia and bake off the sourdough. You can even go one step further if you want is to, you can actually, uh, if you made the poolish on Wednesday, then you could make your, your baguette even and retard those overnight and, and bake them the next day. But so I, right now I would plan that you make your, your poolish and everything on, on Thursday and, and make the baguettes and stuff on Friday. And so I'll put these in for today for we, uh, we can bake them off for the next class. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you've seen the you've seen the, the sourdoughs here. We'll try and get uh, we'll try and get um, 
Oh yeah, you should be pretty good on the on the uh, yeah. Just for the other things, just have to weigh up some ingredients. I only weighed for the first class. Oh yeah, no problem. Yeah. And I can do that as you go on the yeah. mark. No problem. Uh, they should be done by Thursday. By Thursday, your part starter should be done. Yeah, should you should be. be... What I wanted to mention to you guys is there's two, there's two, there's two uh, sheets here for the starter. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, there's there's the first one, which is kind of the, the uh, first one you come across is the artisan bread planning chart, and the second is the artisan bread planning chart, the bigger one. So you can use this to put your times in there. So you know that it's 24 hours between the beats, right? Yeah, you need a handout, right? Yeah. Actually, I'll get you one. Oh, sorry about my math. Um, it was 150 starter to be to be to prepare uh, dough for rest. That for rest. That's for the one. The, so 150 grams of of starter is that 15 percent baker's percent of the total recipe of sourdough. Because everything, if you look at your sourdough recipe, um, your the sourdough recipe is based on a thousand grams of flour, right? So you have a thousand grams of flour, which is 100%, and you have 150 grams of sour, which is 15% of that. Of that, you have 80 gram, 800 grams of water, which is 80%. You have 20 grams of salt, which is 2%, um, and you have 30 grams of extra, which I just used gluten, um, or you can leave it out altogether. But that would be 3%, right? So you can see how that works. Like the um, every baker will have one, the standard white bread recipe in your repertoire as a baker. If you just needed to have a standard sliced white or a white bread bun in your recipe, in your restaurant or anything like that, it's called a 2% bread. So it's 100% flour, 2% sugar, 2% milk powder, 2% fat, 2% yeast. Um, it's 2% it's of all of them and 2% salt, right? Um, yeah, like, yeah, pound cake is the, the name it gets it is from is it's a pound of everything, right? In French, they call it a four quarter cake because it's, it's, four it's four quarters, you know, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, butter, sugar, fat, uh, butter, sugar, flour, and eggs, right? And it's equal amounts of everything, right? Good. Um, <clears throat> so, oh yeah, the focaccia, yeah, we've got to do. So let me just cover these guys up. Get them. Where did I put my... And uh, yeah, because you get to do all this work and you got to wait all that time, and then surprise, it didn't turn out. <laughs> well, you know what? It's bread. How bad can it be? Right? Of course, all the whole fridge is going to be the hospital. You open the fridge door one more. more yeah. Well, my my wife and I have been together for 38 years, and and how I actually met her is that, um, and I don't know if I told you this. Yeah, we were. I was telling Angie and Callum about it the, the other night. Is I hired her. Right? Um, that's actually how I met her. Right? I was a pastry chef in a croissant shop in downtown Toronto, um, and we needed help. Um, when at a time when when once once my wife was trained and working with me, we produced between three to 4,000 croissants a day. Um, they were sheeted on a, like the dough was sheeted on a dough, reversible dough sheeter, but we would cut them all with a French knife by hand and roll them all by hand. Right? Um, a dough sheeter is a big machine and it's got two handles on it like this. And it's probably the left of the table. And the belt there, and the belt there. And then the middle of the roller. So the, the belt, 
Yeah. So as, as you're rolling, so rolling is a reduction process. So you, as you're rolling out, so you have these two stainless steel rollers that you start off at 30 millimeters apart or three centimeters and you pass the dough through, right? And so the, the rollers push it to a certain point and then the belt essentially grabs it and pulls it, pulls it through. And then you reduce the rollers, say from 30 to 25 and pass it through and then down to 20. And then you know, and go back and forth, right? There's a there's a reduction. I actually worked in one hotel. I had the opportunity is that I had one that was programmable, so it was really cool. So um, you would put the the dough on the sheeter and push the croissant pattern, and it would just run and roll the dough out by itself automatically. It had electronic eye that know when it would pass, wow. and it would reduce the rollers. And, boom. and then you know, I could go and do something else, or go grab the next dough. And then come back and you uh, turn it over, lower the cutter assembly, turn it on, it would come through and cut them. And then you pull them off and put them through a croissant roller. So it was a one man job. I was still making 3000 croissants a day, but I was doing it all by myself now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I hired her um, as my assistant in a, in a pastry shop and cafe. And so we've been together for a long time and she, she gets, because she's used to, what I can do, and she gets very critical, right? And so when she saw, you know, these breads come out of the oven last night, she said, what's wrong with them? <laughs> they don't look that good. <laughs> yep, always. Yep. Oh, so this is the focaccia. And so for the focaccia, we're just going to use a, uh, do you have um, a mat or something for this, right? And some olive oil, chef. Yeah. See, I wasn't awake this morning. Thank you, perfect. No, that'll be fine. I'll maybe later, but right now I'm fine. So again, we're gonna put cornmeal or wheatlets, cream of wheat on the bottom. Perfect. Thank you. So I'm taking it out of the bowl upside down and just loosely getting it first into the shape that I want to fit the pan. So that we basically want to stretch it across the pan. That is the trick, getting it off the table onto the pan. Yeah, I put a little bit of flour on the table first, on right? Table. And on your gloves, so I see you've got yeah. a little dusty. So I just want to even it out as much as possible first. Guys, we might have run a little late here. Are you guys good with that? Anything pressing for you guys? Get the piece of bread. Well, oh, oh, no, no. Who do you work for? Oh, the Trouble Center. Oh, yeah. And Sydney River? Uh, Sydney. That's a pretty uh, herb head job, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I work here. Maybe make a big one. Is that right? I, I thought about doing it. Just, uh, there's something in me that wants to work at the Trouble Center for so long. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I have about four months in. Yeah. And working, my husband's health is so much better. I don't have that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
So like the, so um, I, uh, um, when I took it out, I didn't deflate it a whole lot, you know, just kind of stretched it out a little bit and then onto here, get it the shape and then just stipple it with the olive oil, right? Um, best is a good, I mean, you could, in a pinch, you could use canola or something like that as well, but best is, is a good olive oil. At this point, you can also put herbs on it or, you know, kosher olives. salt or things or olives or things like that. We're just going to bake it plain for today. And in fact, Jeff, even when they do that, they'll flavor the oil. If yeah. You can, you, can, you can use infused oil on the flavoring. Yeah, this is beautiful. You look at the beautiful. Oh, yeah. There's like a great little bakery in, in uh, um, uh, New York City in, in uh, um, you know, the Central Stain Train Station. Right. Um, and uh, and that's all they have is, is all these different focaccia breads. It's really good. Beautiful right. Yeah. Presentation. Yep. Right. So, so we're going to. Tomatoes, 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 yeah, that's another one. So then this doesn't need to go to another proof necessarily at this point. We could put it right in the oven, right? So I'm going to bake it off in that oven over there. Um, and same thing, a little bit of steam, hot oven. Jeff, you need your bottle? No, this, the oven has steam. And the timer, we're going to give it. Five minutes. There we go. Hmm? Oh, okay. No, that should be fine. Yeah. Okay. So all we have left right now is we're, the baguettes need just a few more minutes before I can score them. Um, and we're almost on time. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? And it doesn't have to necessarily be specific related to this. I'm happy to answer other questions. Ah. Well, um, croissants and Danishes are best what are called a three-quarter proof. Okay. Um, and so when you when you fully proof bread. Um, uh, like, you, you know, when, when I showed you the, when you round it, you have that tension um, and the baker will say that there's life in it. Okay. That it springs back. It has life. And so as you're proofing, you lose more and more of that resilience. All right. So when you're at a full proof, um, uh, what we do often with proofing cabinets like this is right now, it doesn't look very steamed up, but sometimes they're really steamed up. And then what you do is you, you wipe your finger on the glass to get it moist. But you basically want to have a moist finger and you touch the surface of the bread, just a gentle touch. And I'll be able to show you that with the baguettes in a moment too. When it does not spring back at all, it is fully proofed. If it collapses when you touch it, it's overproofed. Okay. If, it, if, it, if you touch it and it comes back a little bit, 
or just very slowly, right? That's about a three quarter proof, that's what you want, right? that's okay? That's it. Because the thing with poussants is you want some life in it as so that as the, as the you know, that's why I, I still good. So, so that's it. So it gets that nice stretch and um, as the, the steam lamp uh, uh, comes up with the lamination. Um, that's why it's, it's basically croissant is a little bit like combination puff pastry and bread at the same time, right? Um, have you guys talked about the history of croissants yet at all? Or have you heard about it? No. Uh, well, this is, uh, this course is, uh, is just in our slideshow. Yeah, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun fact type thing. Um, and uh, hey, hello. Good, thank you. Todd. Nice Todd. to meet you, Todd. Yeah, me too. Very nice to meet you. Yes, how are you? And um, and so um, the the thing about croissants is that we, we tend to because of the French name croissant we tend to attribute it to the French all the time, and, and in reality the French uh, in recent history in the last couple hundred years simply repopularized it. Um, they've refined it, made it this this flaky wonder that we are know today the way it is, and 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 even that has progressed over decades and gotten better and better and better over the years, right? And as people become, you know, the general populace becomes more educated too and more aware of different culinary things, you know, I mean, a lot of the fancy culinary restaurants we had today are, were not, uh, uh, you know, accessible by average people. Uh, one, because of affordability and, and sometimes even just they wouldn't let them in, right? Or like you had to have a blazer and a tie, otherwise you couldn't come in. And people couldn't afford just that sometimes, right? Because there was a big class separation, you know, years ago, right? And so that's, that's the, the good thing about how we've progressed in a lot of areas like that. Uh, but croissants actually originally come from Austria. And it's, a, it's really interesting how many traditions come from other parts of Europe. In other words, meaning even though the, the French and the Germans are the ones that sort of seem to have perfected everything and stuff, but a lot of these traditions are from Poland and Austria and Turkey and, and Norway and everything else like that. And so the croissant was created by bakers in Austria as a way of celebrating the defeat of the uh, Turks in the Ottoman Empire uh, because it was a symbolic devouring of the crescent on the uh, Turkish flag, uh, right? So, and, and they just, in, in, in Austrian dialect, they just call it a gipfel, right? So it was flaky, it was laminated, um, but it was a dough that they would stretch really long and, and so it would wrap around lots of times. So it didn't have quite this really fluffy characteristic we have now, not right? Quite um, not quite as crisp, yeah. Um, and, uh, and so and that, that is the history of, of that type of uh, croissant. And I, I love these, these tidbits, like, and like speaking of other bread baking things in that sense is like, um, the other one I really love is, is bagels. Um, and so uh, bagels are, are made um, from, hmm? no, that's pretzels. pretzels. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that after, but uh, bagels uh, is basically, it, it's that round bread that it's boiled in water after it's proofed before you, you bake it. Um, and how they, people tend to associate bagels a lot with uh, Jewish culture because of the popularity of bagels in New York or Montreal and things like that. Um, but they actually are Polish. Um, and what they, where, where they came from in that sense was that, um, again, there was, or no, so they were created in Austria for uh, a visit of the Polish uh, czar, the Polish king, um, Stanislaus at the time. And the Polish king was a big fan of polo. And polo is a game played on horses, right? Where you, you're hitting the ball with this mallet and stuff like that. So in honor of his love of horses and polo, the things like that, they came up with the bread and it basically to resemble the stirrup of, that you put your foot in uh, on the, the, the horse. And stirrup in German is bügel, right? So bügel over the years just became, re, you know, the word changed and it became bagel. Right, um, and so it's, it's a lot of these interesting stories. Like, and there's a lot of these exchanges between um, the, the the Polish and the the Austrians. The same uh, Baba Ogum is actually from again also for from Poland, right? And as the Poland king, they would make him babkas, which is a 
uh, like a Google hub yeast raised cake, and he loved them, but he wanted them to be more moist. So he ordered his pastry chef to make him some syrup with some spices in it. And he would dip it in syrup and then, ah, oh, yes. And he would, and his favorite story was Ali Baba and the 30,000 thieves. So the king named it ba Baba O Rum, right? Because of the, the rum that was in there, right? Uh, rum Baba, right? And that's the thing with bread, the history of bread, I mean, civilizations that were built on bread. Right? Yeah. Civilization was a. Uh, uh, So here we could see, um, as I was mentioning, now these have skinned over a bit, so I don't have to wet my finger, but you can see when I touch it, you see how it, it, it bounces back just a little bit slowly. Right? And if you want to come up, please do, please feel free. Right? It is going to be baked, guys, so go over okay. It's going to get temperature slow. But you can see as you touch the cup. See, it slowly comes back. It doesn't bounce back. So it, it's, it still has a little bit of life in it. So these are about like a three quarter proof. They could go a little bit longer because they're baguettes, but I'm going to cut them now so we can uh, get them in the oven. Okay. You see, you get this cuts on there. How many is that, Chef? Five. Five. Three, four, oh. four, five. Yeah. And that the idea is so that you're cutting in, so that you you don't want the bread opening up like this. You want the bread to open this yes, way, right? right? That's that's the idea of why you're you're trying to cut in on like a thirty degree angle, roughly. Okay. Right? Now, will these? Oh yeah, they have screens. Yeah. Yeah. No. So you can see, guys, there's a lot to this course, right? There's a lot to this. Uh, so you're going to be recreating all of these plus the brioche plus uh, four cent bread. So uh, it'll be a pretty heavy day Thursday and Friday. And so the, the idea of baguettes, how they were created um, as a uh, French tradition. I'm going to turn this down to 410. This oven's a bit hot. Yeah, it is a bit hot. I think it's your fan speed. Yeah, we can reduce the fan speed so a bit too. Two, three, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I find that uh, anything you're up to there, Chef. That's good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. yeah, I find the fan speed is real uh, too high. Two times I got caught up. So, in, in, in Europe, in continental Europe, it's, it's quite common, popular. People like to have fresh bread in the morning. Um, and, like, in my apprenticeship, I remember, like, uh, we, we started at four, uh, and we had to have all the the German, what they call a Brötchen, which is a small little white bread bun, a crispy bun, they had to be ready at 6 a.m. Um, and because people were lined up at the door ready to buy them. Right? And, um, and so in, in France, though, it was more like they wanted bread. They wanted a loaf, right? And so, what, so the, the baguette evolved out of that because a big loaf will take 35 to 40 minutes to bake. Whereas the, the, the baguette, the skinny baguette, only takes about 20 to 25 minutes to bake. And that is really how it was born in that to create something that would, they could bake faster. Bake faster, right? more um, faster. The focaccia is puffing up nicely. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Very good. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we're a little bit late. A little bit, but not bad. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
by 1230 shadows. A lot of our by 1130, as long as they're at the other group, will be because they have to uh, be separated, right? Mm -hmm. so, so. Um, yeah, so maybe, uh, you know, before you go for this afternoon, I'm going to sort of take notes on what I'll be marking on on Friday. So I'm glad that you're you're getting these points. So, mm -hmm. so, mark on. so um, again, this is something we're not trying to make nature chef. I think Dr. Davis, we really want to be chefs, but you have to have this knowledge, even to, even to write a menu or to communicate with your baker. If you're an executive chef in a hotel, you've got a baker and you got a pastry chef, and often they're two separate jobs. You've got a chief head baker, you've got a, a executive pastry chef. And uh, they're two separate jobs. So you have to know the language in order to be able to talk to communicate verbally with these guys, right? So mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of reasons why you need to know this. And again, the history of breads is you want you can do a full course on the history of breads. Oh, so easily. easily. I mean, um, yeah, I mean like there's there's schools that that um, do full day courses where it is you're basically there for like about a 10 hour day, right? Um, either four or five days a week for probably two weeks. Um, like I know of one in Chicago that does that. Yeah, and about, yeah. yeah, it's, it, I think it's around five or $6,000, right? For that course. Um, but it's, it's real immersion in that sense. You're really doing a lot of different breads. Um, Germany is very famous for its breads and its variety of breads. Um, one of the things to, to understand about the, you know, some of the differences with Europe is that um, a lot of these things, whether it be the baking, the pastry trade, or the, the culinary, the, the chef's trade, the cooking trades, is that uh, there um, many, many years ago, uh, you know, centuries ago, guilds were created, right? And these guilds were like associations that um, they created a lot of the the regulations around health and safety and stuff before governments got involved in these things, right? And so by that standard, um, these guilds in more modern day, what they also do is they control standards of identity to help preserve skills, artisan skills, right? Um, Change the road is one of the lines. Yeah. You'll see change in it Every hotel you go to the time of change Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and and like there's certain things like in um, as an apprentice, like in in, uh, in Germany, um, if if you use any kind of laminating fat, you can call it a Danish pastry. But if you wanted to sell what were called Copenhagen, right, uh, Copenhagen Danish, it had to be pure butter. You could only use pure butter, uh, and they have a a um, an iodine starch stain that they can use to check that. The, the department. Um, and so a lot of things like that. You there are certain things you could you cannot call it a macaron unless it's pure almond. If you use any other kernel paste or things like that, you you have to call it you have to call it macaroon, right? Um, and then in like with chocolate, unless it's pure cocoa butter in Germany it's called fat glaze. Right. So um, you're not even allowed in Germany mm -hmm. is fat glaze. Yeah. No white white chocolate is is white coating, white couverture. Oh, white coating. White, yeah, but it's, 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 they call it white chocolate as well, even though there's no cocoa in it, well, it because it's pure cocoa butter. Right. It's the cocoa butter that determines whether you can call it chocolate it's or not. Butter, not. It's the, not the cocoa uh, content. Okay, right? not the cocoa. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's a bizarre thing. And, um, but as long as it's pure cocoa butter, that's the expensive commodity, wow. right? Um, and, uh, and cocoa butter is produced in, in producing cocoa powder, right? So it's a byproduct at one time and, and then became by enriching chocolate with cocoa butter to get the right fluidity and stuff like that. That's where it became the, the commodity. And but also, right? Those yes, but and, and also the important thing with cocoa butter is it has to be tempered properly. There's a, there's a the crystallization process to go through the different alpha, beta, beta prime, a crystallization process is what they call a crystal morphology is very key to otherwise the chocolate won't set it won't have its snap it won't have its gloss it won't contract out of the mold right 
Um, so whereas if you use palm fats or coconut fat or things like that, they can get similar hardness, similar kind of melting characteristics, but they never have the same snap and they don't always release as well. They don't contract as well as cocoa butter does. That's very unique to the, the, the cocoa butter as a fat, right? Um, and cocoa chocolate tempering is a skill where you have to raise the temperature to 45 to 50 degrees uh, Celsius uh, to completely melt all of the fat crystals. Then you cool it down under agitation to 25 degrees Celsius, right, so we'll which is when you, you start to encourage the crystallization, but then it would becomes too thick. So you warm it up to 32 if it's dark chocolate. If it's milk or white, you only warm it to 28 degrees Celsius, and that's your working temperature where it will still crystallize properly because you've set the crystals at 25, right? But if you go over 32, you break that crystallization and then you have to remove all the me crystal memory, like heat it all up completely, cool it back down again and bring it back up, right? So it's, it's temperamental yeah. as we say, right? Um, but yes, and so, and, those, and so those are like standards of identity in that respect. And in Germany, they have 600 varieties of bread, not just names of things, official standards of identity that if you want to call it pumpernickel, that it has to have a certain content of rye and rye kernel and so on and so on, right? Actually, interesting story. Did you see that or did I share that with you guys? Um, do you know how, how uh, uh, oh no, this is from a, a friend of mine, a baker, a French baker is really cool. Um, you, you all heard of pumpernickel? You, you, have you ever eaten it? It's, it's, yeah, it's like a really dense rye bread used a lot for hors d'oeuvres these days and things like that. Right? And um, how it got its name actually is uh, thanks to Napoleon. Um, and Napoleon would ask for uh, rye bread for his horse. He wanted bread to feed his horse. And the name of his horse was Nicole. And so he would ask for pain per Nicole and uh, bread for Nicole. And the German bakers kind of weren't, didn't, you know, with their accent, they from pan, pan, Nicole, it became pumpernickel. Um, that's, that's a true story. It, that's some of the weird quirks about food history. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really good. Nicole was the horse? Nicole was the horse's name, Napoleon's horse. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, we've got about, uh, we're, we're pushing it down, and we've got about 15 minutes left. Yep. Uh, just, just a heads up. Sir. Yep. So by 11:30, you guys are gonna have to pull. And uh, I think we, I think you get to see the breads coming out of the oven. I don't know if you get to taste them. You got 10 minutes. Yeah. So, Chef, I'm sorry. That, that clock is fast. Did this timer stop or something? No, but thanks, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Don't really nice show. Yeah. And then what I'll do, guys, is I'll put these aside for Thursday. Oh, let me get my thermometer and then I'll I'll just check it. Looks like it may be done. Okay, well, as soon as that's done, that I'll look at it and you guys can uh, you guys can both good class today. Yeah, really good, really good. It's nice to have the experts for it. Again, it's not something you guys can see at the beginning of the day. I'm not saying that. You're writing this stuff into your menu, right? Whether it be pumpernickel rounds or hors d'oeuvres or croutons or. Yep, we're good. Yeah, so we're just over a hundred. That's perfect. He calls it German. <laughs>
everything is in order in French, and the explanation is in German. So they're expediting bills, which has no idea. Let's just cut it open. A little strip of the and I'll put the rest of the pool here. See that nice big open air pockets there? Nice and wet, nice and moist, because it's still very, very fresh. And crispy. Very crispy. Are you guys excited? I'm excited to see you guys do this. I really am. Yeah, what happened to this thing is what happened to uh, you, Pete. You follow them up with this stuff. If you Chef Mark said, you follow them up. You'll, they'll tell you, Chef, but it's absolutely follow them up with Chef Todd. Chef Todd is making friends all the time. Of all the chefs here, him and me and Rodney would be the go to guys to get ready. He's got starters going all the time. He's always playing with his recipes and, and that sort of thing. So you'll get chefs that really love to do it, and you get chefs that are just there. Don't take too much sauce, right? You use the same recipe every day. Still, some tips, some tips. Yeah, I mean, try to get that exact measure with your scale every day. Right? Yeah, but most of the, the the key thing is to weigh on a scale, right? Um, I say I'm, I've been working with some ladies out in uh, Portland. Is um, and uh, they're transitioning from as entrepreneurs into being in trying to scale up their business to be commercially viable. And they've been doing everything measuring in cups and teaspoons. And then they wonder why they can't get consistency because when you're measuring by volume, it all depends on how much you pack in there. And when you start to expand that, when you multiply that multiple times over, it makes a huge difference. And when you're working with expensive ingredients like erythritol and monk fruit, it, it's even more so because it gets very, very costly, right? So weighing is really key. Um, and like I use this little scale because it travels well, and this this weighs two approximate with, within two grams, right? It's pretty fairly accurate. The scale I use at home is within one one hundredth of a gram. Um, so like I'm measuring half grams, you know, tenths of a gram is what I go by at home basically for most of the things. And I think we have one here, Alexa. Because because some of the ingredients I use, like especially when you're making small batches of bread with instant yeast, it makes a huge difference whether it's four or four and a half grams. It really does, right? <clears throat> Jeff, there's five minutes left on this. Can I call them? Yep. Just the occasions of the chapter. Yeah. Okay. 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 They may be ready. Let me let me check with my thermometer. They look pretty good, Jeff. They look very good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. These are quick Yeah. So you can see they didn't open up really well. Um, because they probably pulled them from the proofer a bit early, right? They could have used a little bit more, but they baked up nicely.
And you can see there's some, there's not as much as some of the others because this dough is not as loose, it's not as wet, but there is some of that irregularity as well in terms of the, uh, the pores and things. Fresh bread is always good, right? I could hear there's, there's one or two people, there's a couple of people on, on Zoom. So they're, they're probably moaning and groaning that they can't have any. Thank you. Wow, this is really nice. Ooh. I think the market is on this. Oh, oh, so good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so what, what I had in mind for the market is uh, something like a, a sourdough like this. Um, and I'll just make them in demis. So you can freeze them and reshauffe and and so we do uh, we do demis here. Demis is probably our big seller. You know, and I'll make them a little bit bigger so that you can you can toast it, and it'll an egg will fit on fit on top of it. You know, just on the griddle, right? Just with some butter. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Glad you enjoyed it. Good guys. So uh, have your uh, have your vacation on Thursday. I just want to step forward, guys. One second. Just one step, guys. While I everybody goes in. I think he uses the B word. <laughs> Have one with me, right? Um, easy to remember if you want to email me. It's Mr. Like Mr. Dot Pastry. Dot Ca at gmail.com. Okay.
All right. Thank you. Yep. So kind of like Mr. Pastry Canada. Right? All right. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, my in. pleasure. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks. I, I love your bread. I can have make bread stuff again. Oh, so cool. Yeah. And uh, as you were saying, a lot of it's peel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we are doing it last year, and for the first year, and like he was going with the thermometer for the water, right? Now, like, yeah. So you do it up. Kind of feel it, right? Feel it. With with experience, and, yes, yeah. And, and um, they were uh, doing like the window pane test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just kind of feel it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of this, even those those uh, pie doughs that we did, so much feel and, and look. But that's that 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 is the what is you know that's the artisanal skill and like it always reminds me of when um, when it comes to patent writing when they write patents about a, a certain process or something like that, they'll refer to a person skilled in the art of, right? Um, so if it's, it's got to do with bread breaking or bread processing, they, they won't just set a baker. They'll say a person skilled in the art of bread making. Bread making. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's that skill. It's understanding still those things like the window test, oh, yeah. you know, temperatures and all that stuff. But you know, when you've done it enough, you have a feel for it, you right? Yeah. Away, you know, yeah. Right? yeah. And you're just pulling it out of your 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 skills and yeah. your skills piece. It's like when there's big production. Like I've worked in bakeries where, um, you know, doing technical support and stuff, and then and they're they're running those in what are called horizontal mixers. So that's like they have a silo up above or a scale that dumps the flour in. They put in like 250 pounds of flour or more into this mixer, and it's got like a, a a twisted thing that goes through that that mixes it so it mixes a, a bread dough in like three minutes right um That's and incredible. and yeah. um <clears throat> and so and then i remember i was there with a competitor and we're you know and we're sort of troubleshooting see seeing what was going on with the trouble the baker was having and the dough starts coming it, it tilts down and tilts into a like a hopper where it gets divided and all that so i'm stuck my hand in and feeling the dough and it's like yeah that's okay that's cool right and and the other guy's, oh, that dough's way too hot. That's way too hot. And I said, no way. That's, that's like 75 degrees. That's, that's, you that's fine, right? And I said, okay, fine. I'll go, go out to my car. I'll get my thermometer. I got the thermometer, stuck it in. It's 75 degrees. Oh, Bang right. on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. And look, you can find Mark online. He gave you those. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, yeah, he's uh, he'll see him at the market on Saturday. Uh, yeah, yeah, at Falmouth Street. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna need to go to that. So, he, so it's he and I are he and I are there. I've got a partner, and uh, he does all this fresh. They, you see them line in, they line up now. They just come right to the fresh croissants, and, and we do a uh, nice breakfast. So it's a, we got a pretty good crowd on Saturday. So. I would need to go in, but when uh, Lancaster City was there, like the first week of October, a lot of the fresh produce. Kind of like, yeah, she's done, and he's done. That's the worst part about living there. Right? There's no, nobody really has fresh produce in there. So, what about uh, like, what's your three chair? Yeah, I've got it. But uh, there's no fresh in there. Uh, she was our mark, she was our, uh, she was our uh, director of marketing for COVID. Okay, but it's a first shot, right? When she came from Europe, I came from there.
Oh, wow.
Mm -hmm. and, and remember, bread is always better when somebody else makes it. <laughs> <laughs> he, now, this guy, he's from, he's from north of Smoky, mm -hmm. so the English side. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a fisherman. Mm -hmm. He made bread with his grandmother and has that interest. And he's in the culinary art. So uh, really just a, uh, uh, well, a, a guy that just, this is the right calling for him. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I just I realized as I got started, I don't know what I was thinking. I spaced out, so I'm I'm gonna fake it at this point because I didn't prepare the bigger and the poolish for the second class. So I'm just making it now. <laughs> That's why I mean I'm gonna fake it. It's, they're not gonna have the right time, but um so, at that point we just get them in the oven. They try to eat. Well, we, I can even use it as a you know teaching moment in the no, sense that this is what it looks like if you don't do it. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 